Madam Mayor. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, Chad, you want to kick this off? Sure. Uh, Mayor and Council, as always, thanks for your uh, time tonight. Um, <coughs> I would like to start with just some introductions and then we'll kind of go through the process for tonight. Um, on the Zoom tonight is uh, Mary Stepanski from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And I'll be handing it off to Mary here shortly. Uh, we have uh, members of the Agamene Park Task Force as well. Uh, Barry Draskowski, uh, Mike Kennedy, Richie Swanson, and Jim Gromick. Those individuals were appointed by the mayor and the council as part of the Agamene Park Task Force. So they are here also in case you have specific questions tonight. Um, we're, again, after introductions here, I'll just go over a, rare, a very brief history of Agamene Park, very quick and, and brief, um, and then really discuss why we're here tonight. And then I'll turn it over to Mary to discuss more of the management plan. Um, again, why we're here, um, you know, the city, as I know many of you know, uh, was donated Agamene Park, which is approximately 1,800 acres of land uh, by John Latch. Um, we have struggled, uh, the city, with jurisdiction of this property because it is uh, in the state of Wisconsin. And those jurisdiction issues really were highlighted in January of 2007 and again in May of 2009 uh, when the city received uh, warnings of wetland violations from Wisconsin DNR. And those were primarily caused by um, off-road use uh, within the park. And following those letters, uh, the city, the community, and certainly Fish and Wildlife really ramped up uh, discussions to consider uh, park management. And through those continued discussions and negotiations, a lease was signed in March of 2018 uh, between the city of Winona and Fish and Wildlife. A requirement of that lease was to establish a citizens group or task force, like I mentioned, to develop the management plan uh, for Agamene Park. And I, I think Mary will likely go over this, but before I turn it over to her, just to reiterate that in this, uh, discussion with the management plan, we do have the specific area of Agamene Park that we're referring to. So it does not cover what we would consider the entirety of Agamene Park. In, part, part, in, in particular, uh, you know, really the um, Agamene Park Road and now where the flyway trail comes in is, is basically the boundary of, of this lease agreement. And again, I think Mary probably will touch on that. Um, but just to keep that in mind as we go through this, uh, we are, we are, that that section of Agamene Park is not uh, directly related in this management plan. So again, uh, Mary's going to go over the management plan for us. And again, if you have questions for us at the end, uh, myself, Mary can answer, or again, we have members of the task force with us tonight in case there's a specific question. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mary uh, Stefanski with U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So thank you, Chad. Hi, everyone. Um, Mary. You got a copy of this. I'm trying to get it where you can see it. The Agamene Park plan. I wanted to point out that it's dated December of 2019. And we left it that way because that was the last time that the committee had gotten together and agreed that this was a draft that we all could live with. And several things have actually happened since then, but the intent was we were gonna have this draft in the spring, it was gonna go out for a 30 day public review. And I think we all know what happened in the spring. And so that didn't occur, but we'd like to still move forward and, and at this point do some kind of virtual public review of the plan. So I'm just gonna hit a few highlights. Um, if you looked at the plan, it's actually very short. It's only eight pages long. That was intentional. Uh, it's written in broad generalities so that we have a lot of flexibility available to us and we can adapt as things change. So we used mainly documents um, from the city, which were in 1998, the community resources plan. And then there was a 2005 trail system plan. And then of course, city ordinance. 
From the refuge side, we referenced our comprehensive conservation plan, which you may have heard of as the CCP, um, our habitat management plan, and 50 CFR, which is the Code of Federal Regulation. And that's where we get all of our refuge regulations from. So those were what we used. Um, there were five main points where city and refuge did not match. And those were alcohol, camping, campfires, pets, and vehicles. And if you look on page five of that plan, you'll see there's five bullets there where we address those. And that was what um, the committee felt was the best way to go forward with those five topics. It's always gonna be open for further discussion, but that's what we had decided back in December. Uh, like I said, we'll need a 30 day review. At this point, um, we've, well, since the lease has been signed, we've been providing uh, enforcement where we can. A part of the enforcement issue is that it needs to be posted and most of that posting has been completed. We couldn't do it when it was flooded and this year we finally got non-flood conditions and so we've been out uh, trying to get the boundary posted so that our officers have a sign. Um, our biggest problem has still been dumping at Agamene. We've taken care of several dumping cases out there uh, and we've been working very closely with the Wisconsin conservation officer, she's been helping us a lot out there as well. Um, the points on the plan where I would expect a lot of comment from the public would be about bi bicycles and vehicles. And both of those are not permitted to cross refuge lands. And that is a refuge regulation that's been in place for a very long time and mainly because of the damage they cause to fragile lands and of course flooded lands. And Agamene is uh, both a wetland and a floodplain forest all of the time. So the new bike trail is going to cause even more temptation as more bikers are coming across. Uh, we would ask that bikes not go onto Agamene. And so our friends group, we have a Friends of the Refuge Headwaters is actually um, already agreed to pay to put in a bike rack so that people, if they wanted to go explore Agamene on foot, they could securely leave their bike at the head of the trail. And the city has gotten um, funding for the bike repair station and a bench to be put there as well. So there's some options for people to feel secure leaving uh, a bike behind. And as far as um, vehicles are concerned, uh, right now people can access um, up to the barricades, which are basically at the Excel power line. Um, and then from December 1 to March 15th, they can access beyond that to, for the ice fishing opportunities. I've been out there in late December, January. It's not froze. Um, it's always a possibility that the ground isn't froze and there's a lot of destruction that has occurred out there. That was part of the concerns from Wisconsin DNR. Part of the recommendation from the 2005 plan and also um, from Wisconsin was to not allow vehicle access. We are in the process of putting up a gate at the head of what is called River Road with the intention of closing that gate so that there wouldn't be any vehicle access at any time. And I can only expect that um, over time it's gonna to continue to be less freezing uh, of grounds in the, in the winter and more flooding in the spring and summer. And I would expect that we're gonna to continue to see that. Uh, right now, we do have funding to fix the damage on River Road. And our intent would be to fix it enough so that Excel can get to the power line as they need to for access, but otherwise to fix it so it's safe for people to just hike on, uh, walk on, because right now the, the ruts out there, are, I'm short, but they're still over my knees in order to get through there. So that causes people to go around, of course, and we don't want that occurring either because that also causes damage. So those are the two things that I would expect we would get a lot of public comment on, and we'll just have to review through those and, and come up in the end. Um, as with, since we're now the managing agency, uh, we will take care of the public review. We'll take care of if there's any projects that are gonna go out um, that we agree to for infrastructure or anything else that occurs, we will take care of all the paperwork that goes along with that, which is the, um, the NEPA, the, uh, anything that has to do with archeology, span all of, all of that stuff is now in our realm. So we will cover 
that for the city. And we also are the first point of contact uh, and for the public as well as other agencies. So other agencies, if they wanna do something like right now on the table, Wisconsin DNR has approached us about a project that they'd like to do in Sam Gordy Slough. They will come to the Fish and Wildlife Service. We'll discuss it with them. If we feel that it's something to be brought forward, we'll bring it uh, to the city after it's been vetted through us. So we will take care of all of those kind of things as well. So I hope you um, have time to at least, you know, glance through the plan, um, as Chad mentioned, you know, if you go into the park and you're on the flyway trail, uh, the refuge only manages the things that are downriver from that point. The city is still managing everything that's above the, um, the trail at that point. So the boathouses, all of that is still part of the city management. We just kick in for things that are below. So are there any questions? Uh, Mary uh, George here, Borzakowski. Can you hear me? Yep, I got you, George. Uh, so as we go forth with this, uh, with the gate and things, and would that mean that there would be no vehicle access whatsoever going back to the ice fishing spots? That is what it means at this time. Okay. Is any of that subject to change as you uh, hear through the comment period? Uh, we'll have to see what we get through the comment period. Okay. Because I know, like I say, you know, there's other entrance points into that park, you know, when the ice on the Mississippi River freezes, and there's the anglers, you know, they know their way around uh, that body of water. Uh, there's still ways that they can get in, uh, be on water or access on land with whatever vehicles that they have. Is there any way that uh, any of that could be stopped? Um, so we allow access over ice by whatever means anyone wants to, to use, but, um, crossing land, we don't allow by any bicycles because of the camming action or vehicles to cross land. So right now on the refuge, uh, if you had an ATV or a snowmobile, you could go around an Island, but you couldn't cross over the top of an Island. Okay. But you could go on the water. Correct. Okay. Council Member, Council Member Schoenmeyer. Go ahead, Paul. Mary, thanks uh, uh, for all your hard work. Good to see you again. Um, is it possible for, for anglers to hike through um, back to Sam's? I'm guessing that's where the ice fishing is that we're talking about um, via snowshoe or skis. <clears throat> Yes, they're welcome to do that. And as far as uh, the uh, road closure goes, um, we basically, there is basically just a road to the power line tower. Is, <clears throat> there is no road beyond that anymore. Is that correct? Um, there is a two track. Uh, it's, it is badly damaged. Mm -hmm. That's part of the, we would repair it enough so that if there was an emergency need, it would be, you know, if emergency responders needed to get back there, they would be able to, um, but otherwise we just want people walking on it. Sure. And do we have any plans? And, you know, unfortunately I don't have a digital copy of, of the draft plan for Agamemnon Park that you were referring to. Do we have any plans to have a designated path um, that might go along or follow the old road that went all the way past and over the bridge all the way back to Sam's um, that would be a pedestrian path? Yep, that's how the, the river road will be maintained as a pedestrian path. And um, the bridge, so the bridge at Sam Gordy's is, um, uh, it's got a big, I don't know when the last time anyone was there, it's got a big lip on, on one oh, yeah. that it would be very difficult to get over. Uh, it doesn't have railings. That's a bit of a concern for us. Mm -hmm. One of our points will be to, um, in order to get through our safety inspections, uh, so that you're aware, we have added all of the current trails. And so like the bridge has been added to our property so that we can apply for funding to get it fixed and yeah. upgraded as we need to. And so one of the upgrades will be to get um, some railings put on that bridge. Sure. 
And then I, I have, um, I guess I'm, I mean, I'm curious about, um, you know, if we're, if it's closed to vehicle traffic, if we can find a way to, um, uh, you know, in, in the Tremplo Refuge, we have pedestrian paths that people can walk on that can take them through, through the refuge so that they can still um, enjoy the space. Is that sort of the vision that we're looking at for Agamene that, that goes back all the way back to, uh, to Sam's via the river road? Yeah, people will be able to access it and there's the potential, you know, over time that it may change, but, um, and I don't wanna say it may change, may be more improved so that it's easier for access as well. But we're going to, at this point, bring forward the fact that it will only be pedestrians. Thank you. And then finally, one more question. You know, back in the day when we were doing river cleanups, we used to go back and, and find loads and loads back by the bridge. And I'm guessing that's not really accessible now to illegal dumpers. And not that there are legal dumpers, um, but I'm just curious about where we're finding, uh, finding the dump uh, stuff now. Uh, most of it is very close to the head of the um, the road, so they're not going in very far. It's been couches, um, furniture, God. That on other places in the refuge because it usually happens at the first or the last day of the month because people are moving from one apartment or yeah. to another rental. And um, so we get it a lot at um, McNally Boat Landing. We'll get hit a lot because it's kind of hit mm -hmm. and it's it occurs almost every month. We'll we'll end up with things that have you know. It's usually furniture. So our major one of the problems we've had very recently, and 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 I know that some of the board members are listening in, is is the beach just below the old wagon bridge, just south, just downriver from the bridge, where it seems to get a lot of activity from parties and stuff. Is there is there any way or uh, you know, that we can manage that better? Yeah, so that was one of the areas where um, we agreed on the committee that instead of, we wouldn't allow, um, so no bottles, no alcohol in bottles, um, in glass containers, no kegs, that's a city ordinance, um, no camping on that beach, but you can, per refuge regulation, you can camp on other beaches that are part of Agamene, but mm -hmm. not one, just because it's, it's too easy to get that beach very full of people very quickly. Oh, yeah. So we, we have thought about that and, and put some suggestions in place as to how to manage that a little better. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, Mayor, this is Pam, Pam Iden. Go ahead, Pam. Yes, uh, thank you, Mary, for this, for this report and thanks to the whole committee for putting together this management plan. Is there a, what, what do you think should be done to educate people about what a special environment this is? Well, that's part of uh, the important, you know, the past plans that were written for Agamene had big plans in them for things like a visitor center or an interpretive center. And, and those are things that we really, we didn't want to go there, but we certainly want to encourage citizen scientists. We want to encourage school groups going out there and that can be done by the city and or the refuge both to um, you know, promote that and to offer, um, you know, Richie does a lot of different programs out there to continue to allow things like that to occur and encourage things like that. Um, the refuge also has loaner programs and those will for binoculars and GPS units. And, and so there are all of those things are available to people to use and we'll continue to you know, want those for not just other places on the refuge, but Agamene as well. But if you don't anticipate doing anything like uh, like kiosks or or even an online web presence so people can learn about floodplain forests and nest, nesting birds. Oh no, that'll that'll happen. Um, there's currently a kiosk that's being changed out because the city got a very nice sign uh, that they're adding down there. Uh, we're adding a refuge sign down there, one of our big ones, uh, like the brown ones that you see when you go to the boat landings, that will go in. So there, those will go in. We're certainly open to having educational um, 
guided, you know, signposts, whatever we need to work out to encourage people to learn more about the floodplain forest. You really don't want the us to host anything on the web. Um, our web page is very difficult, although they they tell me it's going to get much better. So hopefully it gets much better, and then we could do that. But I foresee that a lot of people are very interested in Agamene. And I can imagine that there could be a Friends of Agamene that would come forward to want to do things like that. Friends of Agamene sounds like a great idea. Is there going to are are you going to have Wi-Fi connectivity at Agamene as there are in as there is in other parks? That I don't know. Um, we don't have a lot of Wi-Fi connectivity anywhere else in the refuge, so that's a <coughs> long-term suggestion. Okay, thank you. Councilman Thurley here, Amir, if I might ask. Right now. Well, first of all, thanks to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife for their work and for the committee. Um, there's some distinguished people who uh, really have their heart and soul uh, involved in making this a, a wonderful place. Um, my question is, I know I was reading the report, report, you talked a little bit about dumping, but has there been or, or what has the action that has been taken regarding any kind of permanent uh, or squatter settlement uh, in the park? So the, the squatter, you mean the existing squatter camp? Yes. Um, I will leave that to the city to answer. <laughs> I'm out. This is Chad. Uh, Mayor and Council, um, I think the first piece on the squatter issue is that one of the things that we wanted to do was work through this management plan and then readdress that property and the issues with the uh, squatters' rights. So we'll work closely with the Fish and Wildlife again on that property or that area within Agamene Park. Um, it's been, in a sense, a circular discussion with both the city and Fish and Wildlife because, uh, and not in a negative way, it, it's, it's this lease, it's the management plan, it's working with Fish and Wildlife to get access to that area, which has been difficult for the city in the past. And so I think once we begin to implement this management plan, we'll again, you know, focus our efforts on that area specifically. All right. Well, thank you much. Mayor Council. George here. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Mary, thanks for uh, bringing that up again about this massive plan of uh, walkways and uh, uh, different sightseeing uh, platforms within the park. I remember, I believe we were given a grant of I think 70 or 75,000 and then they came back with the, with that plan that you mentioned. And uh, there absolutely, of course, was no funding to go ahead and put in that massive of, uh, of a reconstruction uh, area of that park. But I was down there Saturday and yes, I did spot some trash around by the NSP towers down there, Excel towers and uh, some other debris and things uh, around. But I noticed that there was a lot of uh, heavy lumber that was washed up, of course, during the flood, up against trees, uh, up against different uh, uh, cement posts and things there. And uh, like I said, it, uh, you know, this is probably going to help, uh, you know, manage that park. Like I said, I think you, once we turn this over to uh, Fish and Wildlife, I think uh, we are seeing some changes. And just one question, since you've had this, under your jurisdiction. Have you wrote any citations over there for anything? Um, let me think about that quick. Um, I know we've had a couple investigations. Uh, yeah, actually we, we did. Um, there were some boats that were left there and um, those were confiscated. There were citations for those to get those returned. Um, that was fairly recent. And I'm just trying to remember even last year while um, Rob Hirschbeck was still here, I believe he did uh, write a ticket. I wanna say it was probably for dumping. Um, and then of course we did have the kiosk burned up 
um, at one time. That was before we had yeah. taken over, um, but that was uh, followed up and there was restitution paid to have that rebuilt. So there have been a couple. Uh, dumping's always hard unless they happen to leave, you know, an address or something, which does happen, a uh, piece of mail that we can follow up on. But otherwise, um, there's there's been a couple. Okay, thanks. Council Member Schoenmeier. Go ahead, Paul. I, um, I, you know, unless there are some other council members uh, that would like to speak, I'm wondering if some members of the committee, uh, if we, we could allow them to have a word or two if they have something to say. They're certainly welcome to. Anybody? Mary, anybody want to speak? Um, I'm okay. This, this is this is Richie. I'm okay. Thanks for the great job everybody did. Yeah, I think I would reiterate that um, this has been a long haul that's gone on for years and years, and I think that we finally have a solution that's in front of you that deals with all the diverse issues and starts to recognize the uniqueness of this area and the need for managing it appropriately. And working with Fish and Wildlife Service just seems like a, just a wonderful and logical way to make all that happen. All right, anything else? I want to also say thank you, Mary, and to you and the Fish and Wildlife and your committee for your good work. Yeah, it, we met uh, monthly for several months to get uh, to the point we're at, and everybody did a really good job on it. And I think we've got a, a good end product to you know get out to the public and get some comment back on. And so Mayor. I guess I will ask that question. Um, what would be a recommendation for getting uh, this out to the public for a 30 day review? Because um, it's gonna have to be digital. So can that be hosted um, by the, the city webpage? And we can certainly put it on our webpage as well, but. Chad wants to talk. Uh, yep, Mayor and Council, um, to Mary's point, we can certainly put it on the city website that we have with our other plans like the obviously the comprehensive uh, parks plan, as well as, you know, community center discussion that we've had recently. And we can certainly add that to our website, Mary, and take those comments for the 30 day period, uh, share those comments, and then bring the plan back to council for uh, final adoption. Um, but if you'd like us to host that, Mary, we certainly can. So it's in one place. If you think it's necessary to do both, we can obviously share the comments. Sure. So we'll, we'll get this going probably uh, in the next week so that it's out and then be able to wrap it up uh, before Christmas. So again, just for mayor and council, just for a process for you, as Mary stated, we'll do the review period, tell, you know, look at the comments. If there needs to be any other, you know, final adjustments, we would make those. And we plan to bring this back in December for your final adoption. Okay. Council Good. member Schoenmeier, Mary. Yes. Good, Paul. Uh, Mayor, uh, just and, and or Chad, I'm just wondering if there would be a, or if there will be a public hearing. Uh, so I, we were talking about comments, and I'm just wondering if there will be a, a public hearing related to this. Mm, Chad, so, what do you think? Mayor and Council, we certainly could do a public forum or a, a public uh, comment period. Uh, from a technical standpoint, the lease doesn't require it to be a public hearing. Um, but again, I would leave that to mayor and council if you want to take you know, public feedback the night it comes to council, we certainly could. Um, but I think that pre, you know, this open window for 30 day period for public comment is where we, where we would certainly review those comments. So um, from a technical standpoint, public hearing is not required, but again, I would defer to mayor and council if you'd like to adjust. Thank you. Probably two or three hundred other pages. Anything else? Uh, Mayor George here. Yeah, go ahead, George. 
I guess as the comment period goes out, I'm going to guess probably uh, one of the biggest issues, uh, Mary, and, and with the committee is probably going to be the access for ice fishing. I'll be very surprised if that is not one of them. So, right, I would be surprised too. Um, Mayor Eileen here. Eileen, go ahead. Um, I guess this is a question for Chad or Steve. If we, I don't. I'm not sure how we would decide whether or not there should be a public hearing, but if we forego that, um, could we please um, perhaps put something in the paper with really clear instructions as to how people can give their input, um, just to make sure people feel like they, they have time to, to comment. We'll do that. Thank you. All right, well, thank you everybody. and. Uh... We'll reconvene here in 15 minutes. Thanks, everybody. Thank All you. right. Thank, Thank you, you, Mary. Thanks, Mary. Check one, check one. Six thirty, Mayor. All right. Six thirty, I'll declare the meeting open. And we'll stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, of the United, United States, States of America, America. and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, and justice for all. For all. I have a statement that I need to read. It's 6.30 and I've called the meeting to order. It's a regularly scheduled meeting of the Winona City Council and is being held via conference call pursuant to Minnesota Statutes 13D.021 in response to the COVID-19 emergency. Let me please remind those who are on the conference call line to mute their phones until you're asked to speak. Also, please identify yourself before you speak. As required by the statute, all votes will be conducted by roll call, so each member's vote on each issue can be identified and recorded. Also, if at any time a council member is not able to hear the discussion, 
or one another, please interrupt me immediately to indicate so. Also, just a reminder to state your name before you speak so you're easily identified. The public will be allowed to speak during the designated public hearings. You'll be asked to state your name and address before you make your comments. The public is not allowed to speak during other agenda items unless you have a request before the council and the mayor has given you permission to speak. Now I've got a few announcements I'd like to make. One is that uh, on the agenda item 5.3, uh, which is uh, the Cedar Brook subdivision preliminary plat that's been pulled for tonight. And uh, also want to mention that uh, they're, they're on Wednesday at 5.30 is going to be the uh, virtual discussion uh, or the presentation by MnDOT regarding the roundabouts on Mankato Avenue. And uh, if you have an interest in that, um, you should uh, tune in, uh, Zoom. Uh, there will be information on the city's website about accessing that as well as I'm sure MnDOT. Also, I wanna mention that the new testing center, which is out at the Winona Mall in the old playground area behind the mall, uh, opened last Wednesday. Uh, they've been very busy. And uh, if you wish to get tested, there's no charge. And uh, uh, Wednesday through Sunday, I think noon to four. So uh, appointments are preferred, but you can also drop in. And then I also wanna uh, read a letter that was uh, sent to our council member, Michelle Alexander, and to Tim Breeza from the mayor of Bittoff. With great pleasure and excitement, I received the news that our city has its own street in the American Winona. I'm very touched by this information, and I trust that the honorary designation of 2nd Street from Olmstead Street to the, to the Mankato Avenue as Bittoff Byway will contribute to maintaining the memory of the history of Polish immigrants in Winona. I express my sincere words of appreciation for the effort and enormous commitment put into the implementation of this initiative. I would also like to thank the entire administration of the town of Winona for our long-term cooperation, which is an honor and source of pride for us. I am convinced that there are still many joint ventures ahead of us that will stimulate our local communities to continue their activities and strengthen partnership cooperation. I wish you good health and strength for every upcoming day. May your noble plans be fruitful and satisfying. Stay with God, Rizard Silka, the mayor of Bittoff. And with that, I'll ask uh, the city manager if he has anything he wishes to say. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to point out and, and thank the uh, fire department we issued just under 300 flu shots over the last couple uh, over the last week. We had a couple of events at Central Fire Station. Uh, there was a drive-through at the uh, uh, the Aquatic Center, and then we had a walk-up drive-through uh, at Maplewood Townhome. So again, over 300 flu shots, or just under 300 flu shots. And uh, just a reminder to everyone out there: get your flu shot if you haven't gotten one. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll have the roll call. Mayor Peterson. Here. Councilman Thurley. Here. Moller. Here. Alexander. Biden. Here. Wojciechowski. Here. Schollmeyer. Here. Under the required public hearings, item 2.1 is levy assessments for the 2020 sidewalk replacement project. Okay, I'll declare the public hearing open. And uh, uh, Brian, did you have anything you wanted to say? Uh, this is our yearly sidewalk replacement project. It replaces any ADA non-compliant sidewalk in 111th of the city. We walk 111th every year. <laughs> And this section was main to lobby. Okay, thank you. Anybody wish to speak to this? If so, state your name and address. I'll ask again, is there anybody that wishes to speak to the uh, levy assessments for 2020 sidewalk replacement? Last chance. 
Oh, Brad. And again, if you are, this is the Brad, the IT coordinator. If you're on phone, star six is to unmute yourself and um, star six to mute yourself. Again, just a reminder. Okay. Anybody wish to speak? Hearing none, I'm going to declare the public hearing closed and ask if there's a motion for, from the council. Mayor, Mayor uh, George here adopts uh, the attached resolution to levy the assessments. Uh, Al here, uh, I would second that, and I assume, uh, uh, George, that it means the revised assessments, correct? Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay, a motion by George and seconded by Al. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Hayden. Aye. Warshikowski. Aye. Joel Meyer. Aye. Okay, motion carries. Item 2.2 is to levy assessments for the 2020 miscellaneous utilities project. Another public hearing, so I'll declare the public hearing open and ask if anybody wishes to speak. I'll ask again, is there anybody that wishes to speak to the levy assessments for the 2020 uh, utilities project? One final opportunity to speak. Hearing none, I'll declare the public hearing closed and ask for a motion. Mayor, uh, Councilman Thurley here, I move to uh, adopt the attached resolution to levy the revised assessments. Eileen Moeller, I second. All right, a motion uh, was made by Al and seconded by Eileen. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Hayden. Aye. Borshikowski. Aye. Schollmeyer. Aye. Motion carries. Item 2.3 is to levy assessments for the 2020 Sioux Street reconstruction project. Another public hearing, clear it open and ask if anybody wishes to speak. Anybody wish to speak to the levy assessments for the Sioux Street reconstruction project? One final opportunity. Anybody wish to speak? Hearing none, declare the public hearing closed. Mayor, I would motion to adopt the attached resolution to levy the assessments. Councilman Schollmeyer, second. All right, we have a motion by George and a second by Paul. Any discussion? Uh, Mayor George here. Yeah, go ahead, George. Uh, Brian, were any uh, water services or sewer services uh, done with this project? That's actually what the assessments are for. George is uh, the water services that were older than 60 years or non-copper were replaced with this project. Um, all the sewer services were replaced just because the water main basically took the half the service out and it just made more sense just to replace it all. So most everything's new under there. So are you, you're talking about the main sewer line? Uh, the main sewer line and the main water line were both fully replaced. Okay. And how about the sewer lines going, the extensions going to the homes? Yep. They were all replaced also because they were in the way of stuff and basically it's just easier to replace them. Okay. So that was, uh, that was a good buy. Mayor, uh, I just have a comment on the motion to make sure that it's the uh, uh, revised assessments because we did get a sheet where some of the work was modified in our yes. agenda package. So yes. I assume that's the case. Yes. Okay. Any other Council comments? Council Member Schoenmeyer. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, let's hope that uh, we have a smoother travel over the railroad tracks now. Yeah, Brian's got his thumb up. So let's okay. hope so too. I travel it every day, so. When will the blacktop go down? Tomorrow. Tomorrow? All right. In the so, snow. 
Yay. <laughs> I've seen it before. It'll work. So when do you hope the street is open by the end of the week? Uh, that will be the first of the black cop and they have boulevards and such to do. Oh. And then they'll do the second one. Okay. Okay. Could, could you repeat that? I couldn't yeah. hear that. I don't know if other people. In the end of the month, it should open. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments before we vote? Hearing none, we'll vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Biden. Aye. Borzikowski. Aye. Stolmeyer. Aye. Motion carries. Item 2.4 is the appeal of a decision of the Heritage Preservation Commission on the conditions in a certificate of appropriateness. All right, I'll declare this uh, public hearing to be open. And uh, Luke, are you going to uh, kick it off? Lucy, or Lucy, I'm sorry. So thank you, Mayor and members of council. Uh, so I'll give a report and then the appellant will also give a report and be available for questions. Uh, and then after that's done, uh, the public hearing and then deliberations of the council. You want to share here? So thank you. So this evening, the council has before them uh, an appeal, but the appeal isn't necessarily about the certificate of appropriateness, but the conditions that are placed on that. So just to give a little overview, the um, the process is a local review. And the reason for this is the building was designated locally in 2018. And anytime a historic structure is uh, changed, raised, modified, a COA is needed. And it's governed by city code section 22.27. And so that's what establishes the Heritage Preservation Commission and the process for a COA. So a COA can be issued by the HPC, uh, but it can be appealed to council. So on September 9th, uh, the HPC met and held a hearing. They held a public hearing. The hearing was closed and supporting documentation was provided, including a memo from the building official on air, also a memo on air quality assessment uh, and other documentation. There were many questions and concerns that came about from uh, the HPC. They wanted to know what the State Historic Preservation Office's input would be. They postponed the meeting until September 23rd. At that meeting, the HPC did have findings and those findings were related to criterion outlined in city code. And this is on page two of your agenda item. This is where the HPC looked at the economic value, the architectural merit, the usefulness, the replacement cost, the structural integrity, and whether or not it meets a public purpose. There was quite a bit of discussion about the conditions and they were modified during this process. So again, uh, the COA for demolition, demolition is approved. It's the conditions that are before you tonight. The condition that changed is outlined on your screen. Uh, the, the condition proposed by staff was for the Winona County Historical Society and City of Winona to review elements or fixtures of interest at the auditorium and that they be removed uh, at a cost not to exceed $15,000. At the meeting, that condition was changed to the one you see in red italics before you. Basically, this is also required review by the HPC. It also stated that the HPC will uh, have the final say on what should be salvaged. And the cost limit of $15,000 was removed. So again, the COA was approved. The dis, dis, uh, excuse me, the conditions were discussed at length. 
And according to the appeal within your packet, the second condition has an open-ended cost and could cause delays since a public body would be doing the review. Therefore, the appellant has uh, proposed uh, with staff the three conditions that you have before you. So tonight, you can affirm the decision of the HPC or you can affirm their decision for the demolition, but overrule the conditions and approve the modified resolutions included in your packet and stated here. These conditions in number one provide for an exhibit at the Winona County Historical Society on education and history in Winona. It also puts a cost limit of $15,000 on the fixtures of interest to the city and the County Historical Society. And thirdly, we're asking that the demolition uh, be done in such a way to have a limited impact on the remaining buildings and the Winona Public Library adjacent to it. So with that, I'm available for any staff questions that you might have. Council members have questions for Lucy. Council uh, member Go ahead, Paul. Uh, Eileen might have been in there ahead of me, but I guess my question would be, uh, do the revised conditions allow for, um, so I'm, I, I guess my question is uh, uh, revolving around salvage and the interest that Winona citizens would have in having a piece of this auditorium uh, and having the opportunity to get a piece of this auditorium. And so I guess, I don't know what the question is. Is that gonna be a possibility with the revised conditions? So at no time was that one of the conditions that was proposed. And the reason for that uh, councilman is that uh, there is no entry into the building and the area for demolition of course will be fenced off uh, this is a very uh, difficult project, a very challenging project, and uh, so that was not included in the conditions. Eileen? Um, yes, I have a clarification question. Um, between conditions one and two, so the first one um, involves contributing an amount up to fifteen thousand um, dollars for the historical society to produce this exhibit, and then the second condition is about um, uh, removing fixtures of interest at a cost not to exceed fifteen thousand dollars. So my question is: Are those two conditions, um, when combined, does that mean that the process of acquiring historical items and funding the exhibit is not to exceed $15,000 or between the two of them, is it not to exceed $30,000? I think I can answer that. It would be $15,000 for condition one and $15,000 for condition two. Okay, so from the appellant, a probable total investment of 30,000 for the exhibit and extracting historical items or pieces. Correct. Okay, thank you. Mayor, uh, this is Pam Iden speaking. Go ahead, Pam. Yes, I, I would like to know how, uh, how certain historical elements or fixtures of interest would be extracted if no one can get into the building. I'm really confused about the state of the building and we've all heard about the mold and the difficulties there. Uh, could you clarify that? Are we not going to be able to save any of the pieces that might be really interesting or important to people because of this mold? That's my question. Yes, uh, in 2018, um, a member of the HPC and a number of city staff entered the mill building uh, with gear on, of course. And we took uh, photographs of the different items that may be of interest, inclu including some light fixtures. 
uh, and I know we have Chad Ubel on, on the meeting as well, there, were, uh, there was an identification process and we think that we can do that through the photographs and then work with the contractor to see if those could be safely ex extracted. All right, a follow-up question. So that means that the it wouldn't really be possible for the Heritage Preservation Committee to go in and, and hand select what they wanted. Uh, right now there is uh, a notice of no entry by our safety coordinator. Uh, so we are not allowing anyone to enter the building at this time. Okay, thank you. Council Member Schumler. Go ahead, Paul. Okay, so let me just be more specific. So then what you're saying, Lucy, is there is no chance that a citizen of Winona can get their hands on one of 1,500 auditorium seats to put either in their home theater or on their deck. Uh, so I am not sure uh, that would be, I guess, a decision of the property owner and the demolition contractor as to whether or not that would be possible, but entering the building uh, prior to demolition wouldn't be safe. I say that because, you know, I, it, that question has been asked of me a few times. And, you know, we're all really sad to see this building go because, you know, a number of us, of us have, have uh, who grew up in town, you know, uh, went to events in this auditorium, concerts, school events, et cetera. And, and so, you know, unfortunately, this building is coming down and, and many residents in town would like to have a piece of it to remember it by. And, and that's, that's my biggest concern and, and my interest. And, and mostly I say that because I'm speaking for other people who have said that to me. Yes, uh, certainly when I viewed the building in 2018, uh, there was extensive damage, uh, water damage to uh, any of the seats that I visibly looked at uh, during our review. So they were damaged and many had mold. I haven't been in there for a number of years, but even prior to that, when I was in there, there I, I agree with Lucy, there was very little, uh, very few seats. I don't remember seeing any seats that weren't damaged. They were all sort of you know, separating. They, they were in poor, very poor condition. I mean, there might be some, but if there are, uh, could be something that we salvage if they're in good condition. And Thank that you. would be a decision, I think. Uh, well, it depends on how the conversation goes tonight, but it would be something to look at. Uh, hey, or George I, here? Oh, sorry, George. Um, I don't know who was talking, but I did hear George. Go ahead, George. Uh, question for Steve. Wasn't there a uh, order where the police were not to enter that building if they were chasing someone that may have got in that building, not to enter it? The same with uh, Winona Fire? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mayor Eileen. Eileen, go ahead. <laughs> um, yes, I have a couple more clarification questions. Um, I know we are specifically addressing um, condition number two. Um, however, uh, for context, at, in condition number one, um, it discusses um, contributing money for the exhibit, and then it says alternatively, um, the applicant, uh, may, um, you know, get a preservation specialist, uh, for level two documentation. So is that, um, part of the, um, COA and either, or, or does that mean that they are funding this exhibit and also getting this level two documentation? 
So in, there were about four iterations of the uh, conditions during all of our meetings. Yes. At one time, the first condition included either, either doing an exhibit at the Winona County Historical Society all, or alternatively doing what's called a level two documentation. So it was either or, and after discussion at the HPC level, uh, the condition that remains is the County Historical Society exhibit at $15,000. I think it was determined at the HPC meeting that was the preference, um, I know by the developer. Okay, and so the, um, um, okay. Uh, so then, oh, I see. Um, it doesn't appear that that's reflected in the, oh, excuse me, my mistake. I am not reading the right set of conditions. Um, and then my other question is, um, uh, it, uh, since the, um, so, so that level two piece is being completely set aside, that's not happening. So I will um, state that at the Heritage Preservation Commission meeting, um, in the minutes, there was a motion to require a level two uh, survey of the building, and the motion failed at the HPC level to require that. Okay. Yeah, and I, I know there was a lot of back and forth. I listened and read through the minutes, and it, it, it I know it took a lot to get to that, so... Thank you for clarifying that. Um, and then my, my last question is, since um, it's not safe for anyone to go into the building and it sounds like the owner, um, even if people had proper protection, may not let people in, um, which would, it would be their right to do so. Um, I'm assuming then that there's documentation from the last time people went in, the, the last time city staff went in that the historical society would use to help guide what pieces they want chosen? Yes, that's correct. We uh, did take photographs of the, uh, it's mainly some light fixtures and some entryway pieces, at least on the interior. Um, and we do have photo documentation of that. Okay, great, thank you. Other questions for staff? If there aren't any, we'll open it up to the public to speak. Uh, no? First oh, I'm sorry. The appellant first. I'm sorry. Go ahead. State your name and address, please. I'm Bob Curlin. I reside at 1770 Ralph Sharmer Drive. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Very good. A uh, little background on uh, why we're here. Uh, I'm the sole owner of Main Square Development, LLC. Uh, and the background there is that in 2018, we formed the LLC to purchase what is called the Hardy's Block in downtown Winona. Our intention was to build two buildings besides the Montessori School on the one corner. But those two buildings would uh, have 60 apartments and about 15,000 square feet of commercial space along with about 100 below grade parking spots. Uh, after we got started with the project, the community development group in Winona secured a opportunity zone designation for downtown Winona, which is a great thing for development in, in any community. And because of that, we started rethinking what all we might be able to do besides what our original plans were in 2019, when the county announced they were going to sell their building on 4th and Main, we uh, entered an offer to purchase that building and acquired the building, and then tore that down, and this year have put up a surface parking lot with, I believe, 84 spots. Our intentions were not to leave that as a surface parking lot. We knew we needed some parking places for the clients of our commercial accounts in Main Square but we didn't know how many. Eventually we wanted to build a commercial building up with a smaller footprint perhaps than the county had on that lot and it retained some of the parking for uh, commercial clients. 
Then in 2019, we discovered that we were getting very good reception and interest in the apartments in Main Square to the point that we thought with the opportunity zone, we may as well go ahead and look at constructing a third building, which is the one you see under construction right now. That houses 23 additional upscale apartments. The problem, however, for us that evolved by doing that so quickly was we now have 83 apartments. And although you may think 100 parking places are adequate, they're not when you have a number of tenants who wish to have two cars protected in, in underground or some kind of covered parking. So the solution, one solution, of course, would be to take the lot that the county building was on and just use that for covered parking for our tenants. But we really wanted to maintain that for a commercial property. So we started thinking what else is available nearby that could be used for covered parking. And the one thing that came to mind was the, the old auditorium gymnasium building, which is in a state of disrepair and, and has to be uh, probably almost irrevocably torn down if, if you're going to do anything on that property. We took the chance and approached the uh, current owner of that historical society, which uh, encompasses the Washington Square Apartments on Broadway. They were willing to uh, divide the property so that we could acquire the building with the gymnasium and uh, auditorium, along with the parking lot to the west of that building provided that we took care of getting the building demolished and providing about 40 parking places for their Washington Square tenants. Well, as you may know from having experience with parking facilities, they're not profitable. But we thought this was a good project in the sense that it preserved the property at 4th and Main for commercial, provides the opportunity for uh, Bank Square to get additional covered parking in a good looking parking facility, takes care of the Washington Square needs, and I think more importantly, opens up the opportunity for the city of Winona if they have an interest in acquiring more off street parking in the area around the downtown that we're willing to negotiate that after we take care of the base costs of, of what we need and what Main or what uh, the Washington Square needs, that if there are any incremental dollars can be applied for public parking, we're willing to do that with uh, probably only a, a 5% return on those additional dollars. That's kind of the metric we'd like to give the city planners to look at to see if they have an interest if you approve this project tonight. So. It, to us, it's, it's, it's kind of a win-win for everybody. It takes care of some problems that have been sitting there for a number of years. And as I said, we're, we're not intending to make a profit on our parking. You will have the final say in what that facility looks like. It can be, we could get by with the Washington Square and our needs probably with just surface level uh, enclosed parking. But uh, if the city gets involved, more likely it would be suitable for a two level covered area. And we, we sure encourage you to look at that given that you've got development with Masonic Temple and perhaps with the library and other buildings and with it, just the revitalization of the downtown that this provides another source for all day parking for people downtown. So that's, that's our, our hope that you will encourage uh, do this tonight. You know, we're, we're getting somewhat impatient. We, we have to have something going to solve our parking problems by next summer. All right, thank you. Anybody uh, public hearing? Pardon? Public hearing? Yeah. Uh, we'll open Mr. it up now. Mr. To, Mr. Mayor, uh, excuse Mayor? me, Mr. <laughs> excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Well, Cindy Cindy, Kelsey. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for interrupting, but I wanted to have an opportunity to follow up on Mr. Kirlin's comments. I want to focus. Uh, more directly on what's at issue before the council tonight. As uh, Lucy McMartin pointed out, the issue before the council tonight is a narrow one. She, she did a good job of explaining the background to you, what your options are. I'm not going to repeat that. But what I do want to address is the basis for the appeal and the reason for the appeal, specifically with respect to the second condition. And it's 
our view that the second condition that was imposed by the HPC should be overturned by the council because the condition is unreasonable and arbitrary. And the reason we say that is about threefold. First, the process, and Ms. McMartin touched on this, the process of reviewing uh, elements for salvage and making that decision with the um, HPC as a public body would require that the entire process take place by means of a public meeting, which doesn't seem like a very a logistically sound uh, process for making that or those sorts of determinations. The second reason is that the, the condition provides for a 60 day period within which to complete that review process that would cause delay of this project. As Mr. Kirlin just noted, timing is important from Main Square's development, excuse me, from Main Square's perspective. And then finally, and I think perhaps most importantly, the condition as imposed by the HPC gives the HPC unrestrained authority in this process without any checks and balances and without any opportunity for Main Square to challenge the HPC's determination or to have the HPC's determination reviewed. So in essence, what the condition does is gives the HPC unrestricted control over develop the demolition of this building and a completely open checkbook with respect to how much money has to be spent to choose to save the items that the HPC decides need to be saved. Um, and this, you may think, well, that's not really a very realistic concern on Main Square's part. Main Square's part, Main Square is perhaps overreacting to that condition. But I can tell you the, the condition, excuse me, the concern is not unfounded. The concern arises out of discussions that occurred during both of the HPC meetings. The HPC distinguishes between demolition and deconstruction, and they refer to deconstruction in the condition that they imposed. Deconstruction is different from demolition. Deconstruction is actually disassembling a building by removing its component parts. And the goal of deconstruction is to salvage as much as possible. At the uh, couple of HPC meetings, there was a clear sentiment expressed to attempt to salvage as much as could be salvaged. In fact, one commissioner went so far as to suggest that the entire north wall of the building should be saved and incorporated into the new building structure. And frankly, something like that is just not possible. And if that were to be a requirement imposed under the second condition, the project simply would not move forward. So leaving that condition as open-ended as it is just creates too much uncertainty for the project to be able to go forward with that uncertainty hanging, hanging over it. So Main Square believes the conditions that were proposed in the statement of appeal and that are set forth in the staff recommendation are reasonable conditions. Um, we're asking that council approve the HPC's decision as it relates to demolition, but that council modify the second condition to be consistent with the condition that is as proposed in the appellant statement of appeal and as set forth in the staff report. And I just want to touch briefly uh, before I conclude about the first condition. Strictly speaking, what the council would do tonight would be a slight modification of that first condition because as the HPC uh, resolution contains the first condition, it does contain the two alternatives but we're asking that the second alternative regarding the level two documentation simply be removed from that condition and essentially for the reasons that Lucy McMartin stated. It was voted down at the HPC, so it doesn't seem to make much sense 
to continue to include that as a component of the first condition. So that's uh, the appellant's position and I'm happy to answer any questions or you can move right on to the public hearing. All right. Are there questions from council members uh, to the appellant? I guess not. You did a good job of uh, uh, making that clear. All right, we'll open it up to the public now. And uh, if you have comments, state your name and address, please. Anybody from the public wish to uh, comment at this point? I think Peter raised his hand. Um, Mr. Shortridge. I don't see him, but. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. There you are. Go ahead. State your name and address, please. Uh, my name is Peter Shortridge. I live at 2450 Garvin Heights Road. Uh, I'm a commissioner on the HPC and also a commissioner on the Planning Commission. Uh, I'll try to be brief here. The HPC spent a lot of time working through this. There was a lot of difficult discussion. Uh, brief points as follows. So I think the council needs to remember for the future of this that this is Winona may have created a classic demolition by neglect situation. You know, this goes back years and years of small maintenance and caring for a building that never happened. Port Authority tried to push the owner a couple of years ago a little bit, nothing happened with that. Um, you know, inspections has very limited tools at their disposal, but, and the HPC has even less, and we've been working in the last two years to try to develop more of a set of functional tools uh, to prohibit demolition by neglect uh, and to work with the city inspections toward that. But that's the case, and the case is at the end of it, we can't even go in there to really assess or do any of the uh, uh, potential salvage that could have happened because it's a toxic waste site. The, the, you know, the, 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 the lockers aren't even cleaned out, right? So it's, it's, it's really bad, and we all agree to that. And really sadly, the other, you know, the building is structurally sound, but we all know it's going down. Um, there wasn't a champion for this. Maybe a few years ago, if a champion would have stepped forward to really drive it as far as a theater at the center of our arts district, could have happened, but that's not the case. So uh, the HPC went through this process. We had our criteria. We worked through the criteria, I believe, as, as best we could. Uh, a few points on that. The, uh, there was mentioned a couple of times on this level two that the uh, HPC voted on which the level two would have been something if it wasn't in the local hands and would have been in SHPO's hands, uh, they would have required and it would have been out of the city's hands. Uh, the HPC agreed uh, to not require that condition because we felt that we, I believe that the intention was to be cooperative uh, with the petitioner and to move things along as rapidly as possible, time being of the essence for the petitioner. But that public uh, benefit analysis that we did uh, was part of that to say, okay, let's push this along. Uh, part of our criteria in not requiring a level two documentation and inventory of the building was so that, uh, and that was really what was layered into our condition number two. Condition number two is to say, History Center, City of Winona, HPC, we're going to work on evaluating what can be you can call it salvage, deconstructed, pulled out of demolition, et cetera. And you're right, it is an issue that, uh, as Lucy stated, as far as the interior would be concerned, uh, the key elements could be done by photography. There's enough documentation that they could be identified, uh, how somebody's gonna remove them uh, with a hazmat suit or during demolition is a different issue. But the other issue though, that we're kind of skating over here a little bit is the, and this came up in the, I don't remember anybody saying they wanted to maintain the whole North facade, but maybe they did. Um, but, but really it was the deconstruction or the, um, the, the ability to potentially salvage certain architectural elements of the exterior of the building. Uh, and, and that's really probably the, the, the more important criteria as far as what we're gonna have there later and how it A, tells the story and B, integrates into the buildings around it. Uh, 
the um, um, educational package, the $15,000 educational package was certainly something that is helpful and would help the History Center uh, as far as trying to focus on this. I think there was some discussion that maybe that should be used in a little different way to tell more of the story of the auditorium uh, and all the history of what happened there over, over the arc of that, uh, of that building's life. Um, but so we agreed to a COA for demolition and that we would work with the city. Uh, the feeling was that a 60 day time frame was fairly tight, but that it could be moved along. Um, I, I, I don't think that the intention there was to be broad and arbitrary and have all the power. I think the intention was simply to address and salvage items that could be integrated into, um, into the building going forward or could be made available to the public as a way of having a little memory of that building, even if there's certainly only exterior elements. So, you know, the, the real core of this to me is that the HPC has done a lot of work on this. We actually really are supportive of the petitioner trying to move along. Uh, our criteria number two was really leading up to the very next issue to come, no matter what we do tonight, which is there's another COA that has to happen after this, which is for the design of the new building. Now, what we, the HPC saw in the design of the, the uh, original package presented to us is not really kind of, I think what, what would necessarily be called compatible design. Um, the elements of reuse, we've got a his, National Register historic site and we've got National Register buildings of the library uh, of the rest of the um, uh, Metro Square, uh, Metro Plains building there. And so, you know, the, the issue is we have to have some tools at our disposal and some support from the council to do our job as a commission. So we, I, I think the feeling was we were making, I can't speak for the commission, I'm speaking as a citizen, but that we were trying to make this a very cooperative and quickly moving process. Um, knowing that right away we're going to be back dealing with what does the building look like that's proposed to go there in its stead. Uh, and I would say as an example, as much as it's, uh, it's sad and pains me to that we lost the, uh, the historic park brewery in Levy Park, Bay State at the end of the day did a really nice design job in at least integrating it into the neighborhood. It fits, it's the architecture, the brick, the treatment, the stone. And I think the point for the HPC was to say to the petitioner, there are probably elements of this building in the exterior that really could be integrated into a building that would at least echo some of what that building was and what happened on that site. So I would uh, say that's maybe not deconstruction, but it's maybe a little more than just a wrecking ball swinging, making a pile of rubble that's hauled away. So there's maybe a fine line in between there. I do feel that the HPC made a fairly modest set of conditions. Um, and I would uh, encourage you to leave some of that, even if you tweak this to a shorter time period, uh, so that there's some working relationship we can have going forward. Um, I guess that's about all I've got, you know, it's, it's really a shame and it's, um, you know, it's demolition by neglect. We have to hope that we can end up with a nicely integrated building. The one other thing I would touch on that came up in both of our, our public hearing and our two meetings after that, when we were reviewing the public good, which is this public purpose part of our criteria touched on the parking and it was a little unclear. And I have to say it's a little unclear still tonight because the, First, the issue was that there's going to be 140 stalls there, 130, 140 stalls. So then when we inquired further, it turned out that potentially 100 of those was going to be available to be leased back to the city. Well, now I heard tonight that 40 of them are supposed to be for uh, the Metro Plains housing development that's already there as part of the deal. So I don't know where the extra parking spaces that are coming for that are supposed to help a successful developer, which is great as far as Main Square. It's a great project. Um, I'm in favor of it. But I don't really still understand, and I think the council needs to understand really what's, if, if in fact there aren't any parking spaces even becoming available for this development, if they're going to be leased to the city or given to um, Metro Plains, I'm not quite sure of the public purpose. Now, we probably do need some parking structures in town, and maybe that's a good spot. I don't know. But that's that was one of the other issues that came up when we were reviewing the public purpose and really what the parking number was and what the dynamic of it was. 
So that's all. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Peter. Anybody else wish to speak? Go ahead, Kelly. Hello. Uh, my name is Kelly Fluharty. I live at 960 West King Street. I am also a member of the Heritage Preservation Commission and a board member at the Winona County Historical Society, but I'm here to share some personal thoughts regarding this appeal. Um, I have some written statement here, so I'd, I'd like to just read that for you. Um, uh, historic structures tell a story about our community. They are woven into the cultural identity of this place. The job of the Heritage Preservation Commission is to protect and preserve these elements of our community. Winona has seen too many of these community monuments destroyed over the years and left to waste without consequence. I don't want the neglect and demolition of these buildings to tell the story of our community to ourselves and to our visitors that owners of some of these historic structures are not equipped or supported or held accountable to preserving these one of a kind buildings. The quality of architecture, this quality of architecture will never be seen again in our lifetimes. I would much rather tell the story that we value these non-renewable resources and fight hard to preserve them. I recognize that we're now in a situation where some of these buildings are beyond the point of saving, but in the event that these historic structures are allowed to rot and be demolished, we should make the strongest case possible to preserve any existing elements so that future generations can see what was here and so that they can be reminded of the generations before them that grew up performing in that hall specifically. These items, whether interior or exterior, do no good to any of us sitting in a landfill and this strips us of our ability to tell the story. So within the context of this appeal, I believe that extra care is warranted when discussing the demolition of a nationally registered building. Essentially, the applicant got what they wanted. You know, the demolition was approved. The additional condition placed on this demolition was not unreasonable and it provides extra flexibility. And I believe it was crafted with the truest intention of collaboration between all bodies involved. I urge the council to affirm the decision of the HPC and support the collaborative preservation of this historic structure so that we can have all resources that can be reasonably salvaged available to continue to tell its story. Thank you. All right, thank you. Chris Hood uh, wishes to speak. Uh, Mayor and council, just uh, as a reminder that, you know, the, the, the scope of the hearing tonight is really quite narrow. Uh, and I think for members of the public commenting as well that the only issue before the council tonight is whether to affirm the condition as it is written as proposed by the HPC or modify that condition. And so um, really the testimony should be, should be limited to that. We, we don't need to relitigate or, or rediscuss all of the other issues and all the work that the HPC did in developing uh, and approving the COA. That, that is done at this point. So in terms of the council's consideration of this, it isn't, to, it isn't to revisit all of those issues. It's really only to deal with this specific condition. So just with that, just wanna try to refocus right, Thank here. you. Thank you for that reminder. Other members of the public wish to speak? I don't think so. Okay, that's all good. Hello. Yeah, I'm sorry. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm the, uh, Ted Hazelton, 1073 West 5th Street. And I'm calling tonight to urge the council to support the HPC's findings and, and support their uh, recommendation for that condition. And there's been a lot of talk about it and there's an opportunity there to have pieces of this building live on for generations to come in Winona. And I think that there would be a, it's an excellent idea and it should be pursued. If it, I don't think it's asking too much of the developer. And okay. I know there's a number of members of the public who would like to get their hands on some pieces of that building, be it exterior or interior for uh, mementos or souvenirs. Can that, that should be also addressed. So again, please uh, support the HPC's recommendation and, and uh, vote in favor of the, of the resolution. Thank you. 
All right, thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? Anybody from the public wish to speak to this issue? <clears throat> I'll ask one final time. If there's anybody else from the public that wishes to speak to this issue. If so, state your name and address. Hearing none, I'm gonna declare the public hearing closed and ask uh, the council to uh, now discuss it. Uh, Mayor Eileen here. Go ahead, Eileen. I have just a clarification question. Um, I know it was emphasized by um, Chris that we are, this is one of those times when we're serving in sort of a judicial um, uh, function. So I don't want to um, uh, step out of bounds by commenting when we should just be asking questions. Um, uh, however, is it, it is one of our options to um, find a middle ground between what the appellant wants and what the HPC has proposed? Are we only able to either um, uh, side with the HPC or the appellant? Go ahead, Chris. Uh, Mayor and Council, at this point, since the public hearing is closed, um, uh, council member Moeller, I guess, and, and the rest of the council, this is your time to deliberate. And so it is your time to discuss openly what your views are related to this. So this is a, a, a good time to do that. And, you know, in terms of that condition, you do have the opportunity to modify that condition. Um, uh, staff and the project proposer petitioner have, um, I think brought forward uh, a recommendation on that. Certainly you can choose to accept that. You could choose to accept the HPC's um, condition as it is drafted. From a legal perspective and looking at the HPC's condition as it is drafted, I have some concerns about that. Um, I agree with the petitioner that it is open-ended. Um, I also agree with the petitioner and I have a secondary issue related to it, which is, I believe it goes beyond the legal authority of the HPC as well, uh, in terms of what is allowed under the governing provision in city code. So under yeah. code, as it stands right now, conditions are not part of the code. There isn't anything in the, in the code that says HPC can look at, at the criteria and impose additional conditions. When this was originally discussed, I had advised that, uh, that addition of conditions may be okay as long as they are directly tied to a specific component of the criteria, which is the demolition, um, and that the petitioner be um, included in discussion with that and agree to those conditions because those conditions are not part of city code. And so when this was discussed at a, at a staff level, those uh, discussions did take place with the petitioner and that's how the original conditions were developed. So when the HPC, uh, when they approved the COA decided to change that condition, I think at that point we went beyond uh, what we really could realistically do. Um, and so I think that, you know, in the event that you want to modify what the HPC did, you're going to have to bring that condition back to uh, some level of where it was previously, uh, in my view, because I think that conditions generally aren't included in city code. So with okay. that, I will <clears throat> conclude my remarks. Mayor George here. Okay, George, go ahead. A question uh, for the attorney as well too. Before we do any discussing on this, should we not have a motion made first? 
Uh, typically, you d- you do make a motion. Um, again, at this point, I think it's up to uh, council if council still has questions of staff or wants some additional information. Uh, it's certainly within your prerogative to do that at this point. Um, you could also uh, look uh, to bring a motion as well. Mayor George here. Go ahead, George. Uh, I would so move that. Number two, affirmed a decision of the HPC, but overruled the HPC decision regarding condition number two and instead approved modified or amended conditions. Mayor, uh, Councilman Thurley here. I second that motion. Yeah. Then I have a now question. I have a motion by George and a second by Al. Yeah, I have a question of the, the uh, Councilman Borzakowski. I assume that by doing that motion, you're also, um, uh, that in, uh, means you're uh, applying the staff recommendations for the modified or amended conditions on appeal. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Um, Go ahead, Mayor. Irene. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I really agree with the HPC that um, uh, the, that there are very few tools um, available to prevent the situation that we're in right now. And I know that's not uh, what we are discussing and I wanna stay focused on what um, the motion is and, and what the, what the um, ask is of the council tonight. But um, I just, I wanna acknowledge the amount of work that they put in. Um, because I, I listened to both of those meetings where they were discussing this and um, there everyone on the HPC is extremely passionate and they are all volunteers and so I just I think that that is a very impressive service to the city. Um, I, I, I really sympathize with what the HPC is trying to accomplish with the um, original condition number two that they set out. And I also acknowledge that um, that's a little bit beyond the purview of what we ask of the commission. Um, and it is real, it is a bit open-ended. Um, I, as, as it is right now, I don't think I would feel comfortable um, amending the condition uh, as the motion stands. Um, I would feel more comfortable if we if we found a middle ground um, where perhaps um, it's a 30 day window instead of 60 days, um, and um, if there was if there was a price cap on it, um, just because I I do think that there should be some opportunity for the public to know what's in that building and and especially because it is on a um a, a heritage site i think we really need to be careful about um what happens with it thank you councilman Michelle meyer go ahead paul well, I, I i feel rather stuck between a rock and a north wall of a tumbling auditorium here um you know, uh, I, I, I would echo Council Member Moeller's comments about the work and efforts of the HPC. You know, really, they're doing their job. And um, unfortunately, I, I agree with them that we do have a situation of demolition by neglect. And I hope we don't uh, see more of this. I know that they're gonna do everything they can to prevent uh, this from happening to other, other city buildings uh, or community buildings. I know that the appellant, uh, the owner of the, of the property, they, they've done a really fantastic job and in my alma mater, the College of St. Teresa's and, and working with other uh, private benefactors and rehabilitating St. Cecilia Hall. And so I know that the appellant understands the, uh, the impact and the importance of historical structures to a community. And that St. Cecilia Hall is a beautiful restoration and 
and an important piece of Cotter schools now. And, and I know the appellant understands that. I also feel uh, about this being stuck between these two places about, you know, here we are really uh, a city that's always uh, demanding and looking for places to park and, um, and, and being torn about, well, if, if I should vote a certain way, the appellant may um, decide not to work with the city and, and provide uh, some public, some access to the parking, which I think we so desperately need in, in this arts district. And so I know the appellant knows that. Um, certainly staff knows that. And, and, and I know that as a, as a council member. And so I, I just wanted to make those comments that th this is not an easy decision. The HPC is doing the work that they're doing um, because it's their job. Um, and uh, quite frankly, they're doing a really good job of it. And so I, I would encourage them to continue doing so. And the next building that comes up, um, perhaps we can get to um, the finishing point uh, before the north wall comes tumbling down. Thank you. All right, thank you, Paul. Other comments from council? Yes, uh, Mayor, this is Pam. Pam go ahead. Yeah. Yes, uh, I uh, am, am, did not go to school uh, at an age where I would have gone to this auditorium. I've never been in there. Uh, it has always been in a state of disrepair since I've been in the city for a long time. Uh, so I am, I would be very interested to see what is in that building and what pieces of it could be salvaged. I'm, I would be very interested in doing that. Uh, the HPC's revised condition number two though, uh, leaves for me three areas of, of unreconcilable ambiguity. Uh, as far as reasonably possible, now we've heard that it is not possible to, to get into the interior. That's the, leaving it open as to whether it would be deconstructed or demolished. Uh, that needs to be clear if we're going to revise that, that second condition. And also, but I think it all comes down to the parties will work in cooperation and good faith. I think the appellant and the HPC probably have uh, share a kind of appreciation for what is in this building and I don't know if it's I don't know if it's necessary to put a cap of of 60 days or 30 days on this condition but but uh, that and the fifteen thousand dollar limit I think are are quite reasonable so I I would if it were to me, I would try to amend condition number two to take out the ambiguity and and give the HPC more of a say on what what is saved out of that building. Okay, thank you, Councilman Thurley. Go ahead, Al. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm one of those, and many of us who went to that school, who graduated across that stage, who knows all about it, has been at it many, many times over my uh, junior and high school years. Um, and I was also in there um, after uh, it was uh, not as um, pretty as it used to be. And I agree with uh, Mr. Shortridge when he talks about demolition by neglect. Certainly uh, there is, um, much damage that I observed, and this was many, many years ago, and I'm sure it's only gotten worse because I don't think I observed any mold, but then again, that was many years ago. So I agree that uh, this is a building that is not salvageable, as uh, Mr. Shortridge mentioned, no champion in the 20 years came forward to invest the money necessary to uh, restore it and make it uh, what it perhaps once was in the 1920s when it was built. Uh, and, and I am one who is uh, happy to see uh, something happening with that building. I appreciate uh, the appellate coming forward to 
uh, have a plan that will address uh, at least some of the historic significance of that building, as well as solve, as uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Schollmeyer said, uh, solve perhaps some parking issues that have been an issue for many years as well in our downtown, along with the condition of that building. So again, that's why I seconded it and I, I will vote in favor of this motion. I, uh, I'm probably one of the least likely members of this uh, group to uh, uh, support demolition of a historic building. Um, I fought for the ordinance establishing an HBC. I served on the HBC for 20 years. I, was, I chaired it for the first nine years. And uh, I also have fond memories of both of my kids uh, going to the middle school and and, uh, and programs in the in the auditorium, but I I feel that, uh, that what the HBC was uh, unreasonable by removing the cap. I think that uh, this shouldn't be an open checkbook in terms of what can be saved, and um, I, I don't blame the uh, appellant for uh, uh, challenging this at this time. I think that the decision about demolition has been made. Uh, the HBC has approved it. And I think that uh, the Historical Society and, and the city will do our best to try to uh, salvage what is reasonable and appropriate. And uh, I think that we can do that. And I think we can do it through a lot of the, the photographic evidence that's been well documented, I'm told, uh, through photographs. and. I think we can make those kind of decisions um, uh, that way, and uh, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm sad to see the building go. I don't. I mean, I agree with the comments about demolition by neglect. That isn't the issue tonight before us, but it is an issue that I hope the HPC will continue to explore and uh, come up with some kind of an ordinance at some point. But I think that uh, I think that. Uh, uh, the motion is appropriate, and uh, uh, I would support that. Mayor George here. Go ahead, George. Yeah, I mean, I think just as we look back at this, you know, some people think the city owned this building, but we never did. It was a school uh, school district building. They then sold it to uh, the Washington Crossings developers, and then they had this building for almost 20 years, never did nothing with it. They came to the Port Authority once seeking some revenue to kind of do some repairs on it, but the building was then already gone and uh, that was denied by the Port, so. Just I'd like to uh, uh, come to the defense of uh, the Metro Plains Development Company and Washington Crossings, if I might, because I think they made it clear from day one that when they purchased the old middle school property, that they were not interested in the theater. And they made it very clear uh, that that was not part of their project. Uh, that they were required to keep that building for a certain length of time because um, the, the tax credits and that they were uh, receiving for their project. But they made it clear, I think, to the public that if there was any interest at all, and there have been several attempts, um, and lots and several people that have looked at it with resources, I think, to uh, do something. And all of those efforts have failed and, or, or people have walked away from it. So it's not, I, I think that Metro Plains has been open and honest from the very beginning here that this is something that, that they had no interest in. And that if there was an interest that they would be very happy. And I know that they have worked with people as they've come and gone over the years on this project. And I think it just to be fair to them, I think that needed to be said. Mayor George here, I totally agree with that. I have a- uh, okay. uh, Pam, maybe, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to suggest that the HBC be part of the process uh, recommended in condition two. So the applicant shall work cooperatively cooperatively with the Historical Society and the City of Winona, Cooperative, cooperatively also with the HPC. 
that they be part of the discussion. Is that an amendment to the motion? I would, I would so move. I would second that, Mayor. Okay, we have a, a motion by Pam and a second by Eileen to add the HBC into the uh, mix of the city and the historical society uh, decision making regarding the um, items that may be uh, salvaged. Um, Al, Al here with a comment. Okay, go ahead, Al. Um, you know, uh, uh, the, the motion is, you know, uh, not this motion, but the original motion was to uh, involve uh, the city of Winona. And I would think that by extension, that includes the city of Winona and all its boards and commissions. So I would assume that uh, this amendment wouldn't be necessary because it, um, you know, is superfluous to, to the issue at hand. Uh, Mayor Eileen. Eileen, go ahead. Um, I, I completely um, understand what Councilman Thurley is saying. However, since um, one of the concerns of the appellant was a lack of specificity, I think it is important to state that the HPC involved, especially because HPC is made up of volunteer community members who serve on that commission and city of Winona may indicate that we only wish staff to be part of that. And so I do think it is important to have some of those citizen advisors as part of the process and uh, specifying that would ensure that that happens. So I, that's why I'm supporting the amendment. Do we want to state um, a certain number of members that would be included? Would that be helpful? I think so. Uh, it, it sounds like uh, based on the discussions I heard that there is interest in um, uh, two, uh, at least one, if not two, um, uh, HPC members involved in this process. And I think that would be fair to include two people. Would you Mayor, accept that to part of your motion, Pam? Yes. And what would that number be? Let's two? leave it to the HPC, one or two. Okay. Council member Schomer. Go ahead, Paul. I just want to add to council member Moeller's uh, comments. I, I believe, I mean, with all due respect to our staff who are um, a professional and highly skilled and trained in doing their work, I, I believe that the HPC has some expertise um, that they can bring to bear. And, and I, I think the amendment addresses uh, some of the concerns that have been expressed during the discussions. Um, about identifying uh, certain pieces of the existing structure and the specificity that uh, was uh, looked at or requested earlier. And so I would support the amendment. Okay. Uh, Other council, comments from council? Councilman Thurley, uh, again, ahead, um, again I, I think this sets a kind of a precedent that perhaps we don't want to do because um, you know, we come up with, we, we do many, many issues. And does this mean that then every issue that comes up before the council, we need to involve all of the boards and commissions uh, uh, if they're not required by ordinance? I mean, uh, is this a function of the Heritage Preservation Commission? I don't, I don't know if it is. I haven't, you know, specifically reviewed that specific ordinance, but I, I don't think, um, this is something that we want to get too micromanaged with, even though the Heritage Preservation Commission did a wonderful job in this original discussion, and I commend them for that. Mayor Eileen. Go ahead, Eileen. I, I, um, I think that is an appropriate concern by Councilman Thurley. However, I believe that because this is on the national register that we have an obligation to be extra careful um, about how we go about this process. And so I do think that in this specific case, it's appropriate to um, ask that um, a, a couple extra sets of eyes be involved. I, I think that we owe that as, as uh, doing our due diligence and stewarding a historic um, space. 
Mayor George here. Go ahead, George. You know, I, I think probably the people that are involved in the Winona County Historical Society could probably uh, know that information as well too as to what's, uh, what's in that building. And a lot of historians uh, that have been in that building and of course belong to the County Historical Society, I think they could put a value on some of those items as well too. Well, I wouldn't disagree with that, but I don't personally see any harm in including the uh, a member or two of the uh, HBC in the conversation about what we salvage out of the building. So I, I would support the amendment. Any other discussion or should we vote on the amendment? I just have one. Okay, question. go ahead, Steve. Uh, what happens if there's a discrepancy between the, the members of the Heritage Preservation Commission, the city, and now the historical society. Who is going to be the arbiter? Who would have been the arbiter if there was a discrepancy between the historical society and the city? Would have been the city. Would city staff then not still be the arbiter of that? Well, we have three or four different parties here. I'm just asking for clarification because if, if Luke and other members of city staff are, you know, have to make some decisions here. We, you know, we have, do we bring them back to the city council? Do we have to bring them back through HPC? Do we have to get some recommendation from the County Historical Society? It just, I'm just asking for clarification purposes. Council member Schrommeyer. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, you know, I'm uh, quite frankly, and I, I've said already that I'm, I'm confident in the skills and expertise of, of uh, our staff. And, and I've, I've also mentioned about what I, how I feel that HBC has worked and, and their expertise. And, and I feel the same way about the Historical Society uh, staff. I really believe that uh, they can come up with, uh, you know, uh, an agreement without without council interference and, and without delay. Well, I would, I would think that if two out of the three agree, then that's, that would be the answer. <laughs> if nobody agrees, then I suppose it'd come back to the council. I would hope it doesn't. I, uh, I have a comment also, uh, Mayor, this is Pam. Go ahead, Pam. One of the, one of the factors that may come into play is the $15,000, um, the $15,000 uh, limit, including the cost of moving such items. Okay, so I think that cap by itself will limit the kinds of materials that are saved and, and whether they can be safely removed. So I, I think the HPC can certainly work with city staff and the historical society to, to come to a determination there. Mayor Eileen here. Go ahead, go ahead Eileen. Uh, I, I agree with uh, council member Iden and um, just for clarification to everyone, one of the reasons that I really strongly support having some HPC members um, in this conversation is because the appellant has specifically requested or spe the appellant has said that going back and forth in a um, public hearing process that may happen once or twice would really drag out their process. And so to me, in lieu of having a public hearing, we have some citizen oversight um, in the form of our HPC members. And so I just, um, you know, I have, I have faith in our HPC members, and I, I also really think it's very important that um, community members have a say in this. And to me, that seems like a reasonable um, compromise. Okay. Any other comments? Are we ready to vote on the amendment? I think we are. Okay. By um, roll call. On the amendments, Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thurley. No. Moeller. Aye. Aiden. Aye. Borzikowski. Nay. Schollmeyer. Aye. Okay, the amendment passes.
Any further discussion before we vote on the main motion? Hearing none, we'll vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Biden. Aye. Borshakowski. Aye. Schollmeyer. Aye. Motion passes. Moving on to the next public hearing, item 2.5 is a, an appeal of the decision of the Board of Adjustment for the Whitewaters LLC Mitchell Walsh property. All right, this is a public hearing. I'll open it. And uh, Lucy, do you want to? Uh, I believe uh, that Carlos is on the line. Oh, okay. This issue. Carlos, are you there? Evening, Mayor and Council. I am here. Um, we do have the order of the agenda item um, with the appellant uh, going first. Okay. We'll open it up for the appellant to uh, start. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Council. My name is Mitchell Walsh. I'm with Whitewater Properties. I own the property over at 51 Riverview Drive next to Ace Hardware. It's adjacent to the, the bridge and the vacant lots as well. I'm trying to construct housing. I'm trying to go with a request of 53 feet. This would be less with a flat roof. Um, this is the matter of having a fourth floor instead of having three floors. This would still transition very well being on the edge of the downtown fringe next to the downtown core. This will not change the number of units or density as the third floor project would be the same amount of units as the fourth floor. In fact, this will increase the number of parking spaces and allow the opportunity for extra green space. There are many larger buildings within a city block of the property, including the new Fastenal building at 62 feet, as well as the condos downtown at 58 feet. Also, this property is far away from any single family dwellings. With the vacant lots next door, this area will look much different in the years to come. Winona is running out of room for housing expansion with housing needs. We can all look back at the Maxwell housing study. This is a great location adjacent to downtown with the bike path, new bridge, new fastenal building, and many more amenities that the Great River Town has to offer. This property would support great views without blocking adjacent properties. This building would be a major tax benefit to the city. I'm in front of the council tonight because the Board of Adjustments, they stated they supported the project, but didn't want to be the ones to approve or deny the request. It actually got second to move to support by the chairman, but the chairman could not vote at the time. With that being said, they had to deny, and that's why we're in the appeal process. The Riverview development plan that was done prior stated to take advantage of the remaining lots for things that support the downtown, such as housing. This is one of those few lots left. This project would be a huge benefit to the city, the citizens, and the housing needs that we see not only for today, but the future growth of the city and its great downtown. I thank you all for listening to me and put it in your hands. All right, thank you. Are there questions uh, from the council members to the appellant? Council member Schollmeyer. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, just uh, state again, uh, Mr. Walsh, what, uh, what height are you requesting and how does that height um, relate to uh, adjacent development heights that are uh, on board? And then uh, what is uh, the current limit to the height that you're restricted to? Okay, I'm requesting 53 feet. Um, the current downtown fringe area is 40 feet. So it's 13 feet. It would be the matter of a couple feet less if it was a flat roof versus a pitched roof. Um, the adjacent properties, you know, they're around that 25 to 30 feet. You know, you got some adjacent empty lots that are going to be developed over the years to come adjacent to the bridge. 
And then within that city block range, if you were to go on the other side of the bridge, you have the new Fastenal building as well as the condos right there. So we're right on the edge of the downtown fridge, transitioning into the downtown core. Thank you. Mr. Walsh, when did you purchase this property? I purchased it, I believe, over this last winter. Okay. Were you aware of the uh, ordinance concerning the height requirements at the time you purchased the property? Honestly, I was not. Um, you know, it was still marketed as potential for a fourth floor building. And I can pull up the old advertisement and it still states that. Okay, thank you. Council member Schoenmeyer. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, this is a question uh, to uh, Mr. Espinoza. What's the uh, impact if we uh, approve this height change uh, for this uh, variance request? How does that impact uh, future fringe uh, development requests? I mean, what, how is this impacting the fringe area? Councilmember Schomeyer, um, this would only relate to the property at 51 Riverview Drive. It would not um, apply to any other properties in the fringe district. Sure, I, and I understand that because it's a variance request. But I mean, is there a precedent that we're setting here? And, and I mean, we went through all this discussion and moving this district, this little area down here into fringe when we did the, um, the, the zoning update. And so, I mean, does this, does this mean that we should be looking again at this fringe area? Should that fringe be moving further out? I'm just kind of curious, um, you know, are we looking, did we, did we sell ourselves short when we decided that this was a fringe area? Sure, and I can uh, address that a little bit in my presentation um, and what we uh, took a look at when we made the change to zone this mixed use downtown fringe. It was based on recommendations of the comprehensive plan. Um, that being said, uh, if this uh, was approved to go to the higher uh, height limit, uh, there would not be a, a formal precedent uh, made, uh, maybe an informal uh, backing of uh, perhaps uh, higher uh, height limits, uh, a distance away from residential areas in the fringe district. Each and every uh, variance or each and every request uh, would be uh, separate and uh, heard on its own merits though. Thank you. Councilman Thurley with a question of the appellant. Go ahead, Al. Uh, Mr. Walsh, um, you indicated in your presentation that this would be your proposal is for a flat roofed building. I just wanted clarification. And then you started talking about, uh, you know, a gabled building. Uh, uh, which is it, uh, a flat roof or or a gabled build, uh, roof? It's a gabled roof at the 53 feet. Um, I'm just stating it would be less if it was a flat roof, just so you can compare. So. Do you know how much less it would be? I think you're looking at three feet, maybe. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Schoenmeyer. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, uh, for the appellant again. So, um, Mitch, so let's uh, just explain the difference. Of why? Why would? Um, why would we be going with a gabled roof versus a flat roof? Um, I guess it just can be more for economics, uh, replacement costs. Flat roofs usually tend to not hold up as good as shingles do in our area. That, that's what I was getting at. So there's, there's a durability issue with uh, flat roofs. And, and even though that's, that's the type of architecture that we tend to see from the facade on, on uh, many of our downtown buildings from the backside, uh, a number of them actually are gabled uh, once you get behind the parapet. So I appreciate you responding to that, thanks. Mayor George here. Go ahead, George. 
Yeah, just touching on, on that roof question, I believe there's probably a lot better drainage uh, with a gabled roof than compared to a flat one. And also the type of housing that uh, Mr. Walsh would like to build. I mean, it's, uh, it's the perfect spot. It's definitely a river view. And you, know, you just look around our whole area down in La Crosse, uh, the hotels and the apartments down there, uh, it's all a river view. Uh, you can travel up and down and you see this type of housing all over. And it's certainly, I'm not gonna say is in demand, but it's certainly going to be something that people are going to be inquiring and more than likely purchasing in. Mayor Eileen here. Go ahead, Eileen. Um, I have a question for Carlos. Um, yeah. The I know that we are on the verge of having a new comprehensive plan, and so it's very likely that we could see the recommended zoning for this area change. Do you foresee that happening? Awesome. That Member we will evaluate what downtown fringe is? Um, I, that is something that I think could happen. Um, for the fringe district, I think that uh, what we have is we have a transition that the comprehensive plan had in mind between residential areas to the south of downtown and the core of the downtown area and the fringe serving as a transitional zone uh, moving from the residential to the core of downtown. One thing we didn't uh, focus on is uh, areas within the downtown fringe that are surrounded by commercial and industrial uses and do not have residential uses in proximity. So I could see us uh, re-examining this uh, through the comprehensive plan process and uh, recommending uh, perhaps a slightly different uh, change either in zoning or a text amendment um, eventually for properties that are like this one and surrounded by commercial and industrial type uses. Okay, and then I have another question as well, if I may. Um, what uh, so we know there's not any immediately neighboring properties that have a similar height as what Mr. Walsh is, a, is proposing, but um, there, there are buildings nearby that are of a comparable height. Is that, that's correct, right? The, the... Sure, yes. And um, so for the existing property um, within the mixed use downtown fringe, which extends to the bridge, um, the height limit is 40 feet. Um, but on the other side of the bridge um, to the east, the maximum height is 75 feet. So you have the uh, Fastenal office building uh, that was uh, proposed and has been approved and is currently undergoing construction at uh, 60 feet tall, 61 feet. Uh, and then you have other uh, structures that are taller uh, in that area. Also to the west of this area, um, although the me building immediately to the west is approximately 20 to 30 feet, um, you do have higher uh, industrial buildings as you move to the west along Riverview Drive. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, I have a comment. This is Pam. All right, Pam. Uh, yes, ever since I moved to Winona, I've been surprised at the, at, that, that we have no more tall buildings than we have so that people can see the beautiful valley. All of our buildings are quite, are quite modest in height except just one. Oh housing, one housing building. Uh, I don't think that four stories is, is or that this height is, un, that it would not fit in where the, the, the site is. I think it would fit. I think that it would be more desirable to have, have a river view and have an attractive property with more green space and more parking than it would be to fill up the lot and keep, keep the building uh, on a larger footprint, but smaller. Um, I guess that I, I would like to see us have housing of greater density downtown because we do need more housing. We need, do need affordable housing and that this would suit that purpose especially since we're going to be redoing the comprehensive plan into it in the, in the coming years anyway. There, that's all of my, okay. <laughs> all of my comments in one. <laughs> well, we're actually at a point uh, here that uh, we're, uh, we should open it up for the public to comment and then uh, 
following the staff report, then the council uh, will have oh, an opportunity okay. for these sorts of okay. Sorry, so, out of order. Um, unless there's any other questions from the council members or the appellant, uh, um, I'm going to open this up for the public to uh, weigh in and comment and ask that they keep their comments to two minutes or less. So, this is Jim Vercota. Jim, go ahead. All right, my name is uh, Jim Vercota, 1406 Highland Drive in Winona. Uh, as president of the uh, City of Winona Housing Task Force, um, just uh, bring everybody to up to speed again on that Maxfield research. The 2016 City of Winona Comprehensive Housing Needs Assessment condu conducted by Maxfield Research and Consulting identified the need for 333 market rate rental units by 2031. Now that's in addition to the need for 261 units of single family housing and 131 units of multiple family housing. While we've made some strides towards reaching these goals, we still need many more units of construction to meet this goal by 2031. The 60 unit housing proposal would provide a great step towards reaching that goal. The request is to go up to, to go up a floor still transitioning from fringe to core zoning and by going up instead of out, it will provide additional green space. As the cost of building continues to increase, we need to find ways to allow this type of housing before it becomes no longer economically viable. This type of development really is the highest and best use for this property. And I would urge you to vote in favor of this request. Thank you. All right, thank you. Are there other members of the public that wish to comment at this time? This is uh, Greg Woolitz. Uh, I'm a lawyer in Winona. My office is 678 Mankato <laughs> Avenue, Suite 200. Uh, my comment is that um, I have an interest in this, a personal interest in the sense that, you know, the, uh, the comp plan and the zoning are kind of presented as uh, general guides. And I think sometimes people tend to forget that and think, well, if it says a certain height, it says a certain height for a reason. And that's what, that's what we got. But that's really not the intent when it was passed, not the stated intent. And it, it is a guide So what we really should be looking at, and this has been stated by others already, is how does this fit into the surrounding area? And is it, is it a good fit or a bad fit? And we've got some buildings that are much taller uh, to the east of the bridge and some that are much taller further to the west, but we don't have a residential neighborhood that would be negatively impacted. And others, um, as I said, already made the point, but I want to stress that is that this, this building as proposed seems to me uh, that it would fit pretty well. And so I would encourage council members not to be focused so much on what does the code allow. Uh, the code might say 40, but it says, if you want to go higher, then you apply for a variance. And, that, and that's how we got here to this point. So is the variance being requested reasonable and is the proposed use reasonable? And you know, the four floors requires apparently about a 53 foot height. Um, and I would submit that that's going to be a good transition. I don't think based on my understanding that there's any neighbors nearby that are opposed to this. Uh, I think possibly the opposite, although I, I can't say for certain. Um, and so by having this variance being allowed and allowing an additional floor, we shrink the footprint, which is going to be more attractive than a shorter stubbier spread out building with less green space. So to, uh, to accommodate uh, the desire for something that looks good and fits in, then yeah, you should support, uh, in my opinion, you should support this appeal. And then um, I think it also results in a better parking situation by keeping that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, building footprint limited. And then I guess my, my final comment is, uh, there's different studies that have been mentioned and just talking to people uh, in, in the uh, housing industry is that apparently uh, there is a need for housing near downtown. And this project is a good way to accomplish that. And I would encourage uh, council members to Keep that in mind by by letting this go forward. You you help accomplish that, and you do it in a way that's attractive and uh, a, a really good fit 
for the neighborhood. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Other members of the public that wish to speak? Yes, Dave McCorkadale, 169 Sunrise Drive. Whatever my opinion may be worth to the board. Um, we are short of housing. Uh, the building off 2nd Street, the Mike Root building, it's all commercial. It's all income producing. That still blocks the view if you're driving on 2nd Street looking at the river because you're lower by elevation. So this building will not affect the beauty of the river if you're on that street. If you want beauty for the river, drive on a river road. We are short of housing. Yes, we are. Big reason is medical assistance is not releasing their homes for three years, which we have proof of that. So we, yes, we are very short of affordable housing. So please approve this appeal and uh, it'll look great. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? State your name and address. Hello, Mayor. Hello, board members. My name is Michael Onstead. Address is 707 and a half West Broadway Street, Winona, Minnesota. I own the property right next to Mitch. So Black Squirrel Properties is what shows up on it. The address is 330 West 2nd Street. Um, I'm totally in favor of this project. I'm gonna echo many of the things that have already been stated that are in favor of this. Um, I'm currently struggling what to be able to do with my building at 330 West 2nd Street. It's a 10,000 square foot building. And um, going to school in Winona throughout the years, and being a member of Winona, I see that downtown Winona is successful because of residents, because we do have many apartment units above retail locations. Um, my father just recently um, and myself were, we were leasing a room at Main Square, and um, he is in uh, desire of additional parking there. Um, so that's kind of echoing the prior comments and proposals in earlier today's meeting. So I am a neighboring building. It's a commercial building. Um, I could only kind of hope that I was in Mitch's um, situation to be able to add apartments to my current building. I'm in favor of it. I think it's gonna increase foot traffic for all the surrounding um, mm -hmm. businesses and downtown businesses while offering the housing that is needed. So thank you. All right, thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? My yes. name is Scott Allen. I am in favor of the Riverview project. Um, I think it will benefit the downtown and it's a great uh, opportunity for a young entrepreneur to be able to um, do this project. Thank you. Did you state your address? 20687 County Road 33, but I lived in Winona all my life. Okay, thank you. Yep. Anybody else wish to speak? Uh, Deborah Peterson. My, not, my address is 958 West 2nd. I am in favor of this project. Uh, for several reasons, I think it's a great opportunity for the multi-family dwelling. Uh, it's already surrounded by multi-level dwelling. And I don't think that it would have a significant impact on what's already there or the view towards the river. I think you're setting a standard for a very upscale community. And at the same time, you're not changing the occupancy rate or the density rate. So I don't see a huge impact there, but also by adding additional parking, I think you're going to reduce the congestion that's already on the street, which is a plus for everybody. I think you're going to uh, increase revenue, upscale property taxes, and um, I don't I don't see anything but immediate impact of the immediate area. So I am in favor of this project. All right, thank Plus you. We need more desirable housing in the area. Could you state your name again for the record, please? 
Deborah Peterson, Thank 958 you. West 2nd Street. All right. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Hello, City Council, Aaron Rapinski, 917 East 5th, and I am also in favor of this project moving ahead. Thank you, Aaron. Others that wish to speak? Uh, Ted Hazelton, 1073 West 5th. I I would generally support this, but my concern is what is the exact location? It sounds like it's 51 Huff Street. Would would that be by the railroad tracks next to Ace Hardware, or on the opposite side of the tracks in Riverview Drive? I'm just trying to visualize this without a computer handy. Lucy, you want to answer that? Yeah. And I think Carlos has a map of that area. Uh, but... Thank you. I believe Carlos has a map of the area that he can share on his screen, but it is the lot just to the uh, right adjacent to the hardware store north uh, to the tracks. And we will have a staff presentation here um, after we're uh, done taking testimony from the public. And then the other, and the other question or concern is uh, how, how um, are there going to be an additional driveway or access off of Riverview slash Huff Street to access the property or would they tenants potentially be using the existing entrances for eighth hardware there? Uh, I'm sure that will be addressed in the staff presentation. Other comments from the public? So overall, I, I uh, if those questions can be addressed, then I would be in favor of it. Okay, thank you. Anybody else from the public wish to speak? Any other comments from the public? Final chance? Anybody else wish to speak? Star six to unmute yourself is the Brad I uh IT coordinator. So there's somebody that wishes to speak? Uh, oh, okay. Well, let's go to uh, city staff and the presentation, uh, Carlos. Good evening again, Mayor and Council. And yes, I do have a brief presentation here. Um, if uh, Brad could enable uh, screen sharing, um, I will go ahead with that. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Carlos. Thank you, Brad. All right, as we've been discussing here tonight, again, we're here for the appeal to the 51 Riverview Drive height variance denial. Uh, this variance request, uh, as noted, is related to a 53 foot tall requested multifamily residential structure at 51 Riverview Drive. It will facilitate a five story building overall uh, with first floor parking that's sunk into the ground plus four floors of residential units on top. The height limitation is 40 feet, as we've discussed in the mixed use downtown fringe zoning district. And the Board of Adjustment denied the variance on September 16th. And of course, the applicant is appealing. For the variance request, 51 Riverview Drive is located at the bend uh, where Huff Street turns into Riverview Drive, immediately north of the Ace Hardware building. It is located to the east of Harriet Street. The mixed use downtown fringe zoning district is in light green at the center of your screen. That is the height uh, of 40 foot limitation in that area that extends to the bridge. East of the bridge, you have the mixed use downtown core, uh, which has a maximum height of 75 feet, but that drops to 40 feet if you're within 150 feet or a half block of uh, our district. Again, that uh, requirement is meant to have a step down in heights from the core area of downtown to 
uh, adjacent residential districts. To the west of the subject property is I-1 and I-2 zoning, that's industrial zoning, and the building heights on many parcels to the west of the subject property range between 15 and 35 feet. For the structure as uh, was brought up in the uh, public hearing, uh, the current design has the access to the building and the parking uh, for vehicular access coming off of Harriet Street. Uh, there would be also uh, pedestrian access off of Harriet Street as well as pedestrian access uh, to the Huff Street Riverview Drive area as well. Uh, but cars would not be coming in uh, as is currently designed off of Riverview Drive or Huff Street. For this variance request, just a little bit of background, and this was touched on previously. Uh, prior to 2017, the subject property was zoned B2, actually, and at that time it had a height limit of 75 feet. With the adoption in 2017 of the Unified Development Code, that area was rezoned to mixed-use downtown fringe with a 40-foot maximum height. This was based on the Comprehensive Plan Downtown Fringe Land Use designation. So again, um, the land use designation in the comprehensive plan generally informs the zoning districts uh, for uh, specific zonings, zoning uh, areas within the city. So taking a look at the comprehensive plan, the downtown fringe okay. designated this area as meant to facilitate a similar mix of uses, but at a lower intensity than the downtown core area, which is east of the bridge. As such, a lower height of 40 feet was assigned to the district. But uh, as I alluded to uh, briefly, the main reason for the lower height was to provide a graduation in height from residential neighborhoods to downtown. What we didn't specifically focus on in 2017 was fringe properties that are entirely surrounded by commercial or industrial land uses. The variance request that's on appeal tonight is actually the second uh, variance request related to this property. The first request uh, related to height at 51 Riverview Drive um, was for 63 feet. Um, that came in July, but was de uh, denied by the Board of Adjustment in August. As a result, the applicant went back and redesigned the building and sunk the building into the ground uh, a little bit more and came back with the second request that's in front of council tonight with the 53 feet. The board did, however, deny the 53 foot uh, request as well in September based on the statutory variance criteria. And so the applicant is appealing that decision. For the appeal decision tonight, uh, council options are to number one, affirm the decision of the board of adjustment to deny, in that case, a motion to adopt the attached findings, conclusions and order in your packets. Affirming the Board of Adjustments decision would be in order. You could also affirm and amend the decision of the Board of Adjustment, in this case, a motion to adopt the findings, conclusions, and order. Affirming the BOA decision with amendments would be in order. Or number three, you could overrule the decision of the BOA. For this, it is recommended that Council adopt the motion to postpone further consideration and direct staff to bring proposed findings, approving the variance to the next meeting. Council members supporting this option should discuss the reasoning related to the variance criteria. And for this option, staff has included attachments I and J in your council packets for reference. Thank you. All right, thank you, Carlos. Are there questions from council members to Carlos? Mayor George here. Go ahead, George. Uh, Carlos, due that it's uh, close to the dike in there, is there any approval needed by the Army Corps of Engineers? I, it is close to the dike, and uh, when we do have a site plan and this, this area is proposed for development, uh, we will uh, make sure that it meets all the requirements uh, by the Corps. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from council members to Carlos, Carlos or other staff? If not, I'm going to close the public hearing. And uh, Chris, is there anything you wanted to say as legal counsel? Mayor and counsel, no, I have nothing else to add. Thank you. Okay. Well, now the uh, council can deliberate on this issue. And if there's a motion somebody would like to make, they can make it at this time. Mayor Eileen here. Go ahead, Eileen. Um, I would move that we. Um, overrule the Board of Adjustment and I'm trying to find the language. I believe it would be to um, ask that staff come back with um, 
findings. I'm trying to find the right words. <laughs> Council Member Schulmeyer will second that. Okay, a motion by Eileen and a second by Paul um, to overrule the Board of Adjustment decision and to ask the council or ask the city staff to come back with findings uh, approving the variance at the next meeting. Further discussion? Council Member Schulmeyer. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I, I just, uh, I mean, I, 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 I think that, uh, you know, we, we heard some really good arguments. I, I have said publicly already a number of times that, you know, I, I'm, keenly focused on and, and encouraging uh, infill development in our downtown, our downtown core. And, um, you know, although I'm more keen on uh, ownership property and, and, and um, condominium type, maybe Mr. Welch would consider that, um, but I'm keen on bringing those people downtown and getting them closer to our small businesses and, and hopefully that this project will be completed um, not long after we come out of this pandemic and, and we'll have more people to uh, help those small businesses recover. Mayor Eileen here. Go ahead, Eileen. Um, yes, I, um, I agree with Councilman Schulmeyer and um, I uh, am grateful to the Board of Adjustment for the work that they did on this. Um, I know that they, based on their minutes and um, what they presented, it seems like they were trying to follow the letter of what is in our code and that's what we ask of them. And so I think that they, they carried out their responsibilities. Um, however, I think it's been made really clear that, um, that the current um, zoning and restrictions um, were not based on an area that is surrounded by industrial and um, businesses. Um, and considering that this is very close to the bridge, which is way, way taller um, than 53 or even 75 feet, and there are other tall buildings nearby, I think it would be um, completely appropriate. And I know we'll come back and revisit what the reasonings are, but. Um, I think this, I, I look forward to seeing how this development um, develops. Councilman Thurley. Go ahead, Al. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, in the interest of transparency, um, I want to state that uh, uh, Mr. Walsh invited me to tour the property um, prior to this meeting. Um, and uh, I had an opportunity to get more information on this particular uh proposal that he was doing, but in no way did I ever indicate any of my uh, 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 voting preferences, uh, just gathering information for the property to understand it a little better. And, and I appreciate that. I think I have a better understanding. And, and, you know, I think if anyone who has been in our downtown, especially since the second bridge was uh, built um, and dedicated, they know that uh, uh, this is an ongoing dynamic downtown and we're seeing other developments that are uh, very appropriate to our downtown and, and this is a development that uh, given our discussion this evening I certainly uh, will uh, will support so uh, thank you. Any other comments? Are we ready to vote? I think we are. We'll vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Iden. Aye. Warshakowski. Aye. Schollmeyer. Aye. Motion passes. Moving on to the petitions, requests, and communications. Item 3.1 is the appointment to the Human Rights Commission of Tyler Trepto Bowman and Robert Gardner. George moves to approve the appointments. Eileen seconds. Uh, Mayor, I have a question. This is Pam. Go ahead, Pam. Yes, uh, I would like to clarify that Robert Gardner is a resident of Winona. Um, he lists as his address, he lists the PO box. And uh, my uh, research has shown that his office is in Bloomington. I understand that people have to be residents of the city of Winona. To be on the commission. 
So Mayor and Council, he did disclose that he is a resident of Winona and he does practice law in Winona. And I would clarify for the commission, you have to be a resident of Winona County or you need to represent one of the um, agencies that we have designated seats for, but he would be a Winona resident. Thank you. Council McThurley with a question. Go ahead, Al. Um, I, I have a similar, I don't have exactly the same question that uh, council person I didn't had, but I noticed that uh, since he has uh, practiced uh, before uh, uh, or for claims involving uh, the Minnesota Human Rights Act, Americans with Disability Act, would, would that be something that might uh, uh, cause an issue with his service uh, on the uh, Human Rights Commission? We already have an attorney on. Uh, we do have an attorney on the commission currently, and I have found that it generally adds to the discussion is they have a background in understanding what the law is. Um, if there are any claimants that um, they may have re represented someone else against them in court, I would guess they would recuse himself on working on that claim. Okay, thanks for the clarification. I would assume that would have been the case, but I just wanted to make sure that that, that was uh, discussed tonight. Thank you. Any other questions before we vote? All right, we'll proceed to vote by roll call. I'm not ready. <laughs> Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Aiden. Aye. Borshikowski. Aye. Schollmeyer. Aye. Motion carries. Item 3.2 is an application for an on sale liquor license for Tavern 129 with an effective date of January 1st through June 30th. I would note that the owner of the bar did not uh, renew this summer pending uh, some issues under the COVID. George motions to approve the, the liquor license. Eileen seconds. Okay, motion by George and seconded by Eileen. Any discussion? Oh, Mayor, excuse me, I meant to say license says. Okay. We'll make it plural. I think we're ready to vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Aiden. Aye. Warshakowski. Aye. Schollmeyer. Aye. Item 3.3 is request for a stop sign investigation on 4th Street between Huff and High. George moves to approve the attached, uh, the attached ordinance. I am. I have a motion by George and seconded by Eileen. Any discussion? Uh, Councilman Thurley here. Go ahead, Al. This is one who grew up in part of that neighborhood many, many years ago. Um, I can certainly attest to the ongoing traffic issues, and I think this would be uh, very much welcomed by the residents and the traveling public in that area. I agree. Eventually, we'll get these intersections regulated. <laughs> All right, I think we can vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Aiden. Aye. Wojciechowski. Aye. Schollmeyer. Aye. Carries. Moving to new business, item 5.1 is to move the polling site for Ward 2, Precinct 1, to the Senior Friendship Center at 251 Main Street. George motions to adopt the following resolution. Eileen seconds. All right, again, George moves, Eileen seconds. Um, what about parking in that area? What are you gonna be doing about that? Uh, we will be reserving some parking on Main Street for the voters. Uh, we're looking for um, alternate off-street parking for the judges that will be working in that precinct. Okay. Council Member Schoenmeyer. Go ahead, Paul. Um, 
I guess my only concern, and it, uh, really, Monica, I really appreciate all the work that you've been doing and 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 everything. And and I uh, will take what we can get on this. It's, this seems like it's a little removed from the second ward, and uh, so want to make sure that people know where the polling place is if they haven't had to uh, come out of their ward uh, to, to, uh, to the Friendship Center. Mayor Eileen here. Go ahead, Eileen. Um, I just, uh, I, I know Monica can speak for herself, but uh, just wanted to tell uh, Councilman Schollmeyer and the rest of council and uh, the public that um, Monica called, um, since this is Ward 2, about um, and, and shared with me how she searched for other possible polling places, and it was very difficult to find one, and so this, this was the most reasonable option um, that was actually the closest to Ward 2. So um, I have every confidence <laughs> in the work that she did, and I, I know we all do, but um, just, uh, you know, uh, um, assuring uh, Ward 2 residents that um, that the city did look as much as possible for other options. Um, and we certainly don't want to deter anyone from voting. Um, quite the opposite. Uh, so um, we'll hopefully be back at our regular polling location next time we have an election. And Mayor and Council, I would note also that this precinct does include the West Camp or the yes, the West Campus of Winona State. So we will be communicating with uh, Winona State to make sure the information gets to all their students who live at Lourdes and Maria Hall, and uh, hopefully um, they will make it down in in person, but we're also encouraging, again, people to vote absentee before November 3rd. Councilman Thurley here. Go ahead, Al. Uh, and also in the conversation I had with uh, our city clerk, uh, voters in that area will re receive postcards advising them of the change, plus there will be signage at the former polling locations to advise voters to uh, uh, make that transition to the, the Friendship Center. All right, anything else? We'll vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Hayden. Aye. Gorshikowski. Aye. Schollmeyer. Aye. Carries. Item 5.2 is the Community Center Design Change Order. George so moves uh, to motion to accept the change that would be in order. Eileen seconds. Yeah, George moves, Eileen seconds. Any other uh, discussion? Any uh, Mayor, can uh, Chad touch on this a little bit? Chad's still on the line? He just popped on. Oh, okay, there he is. All right. Uh, Mayor and Council, as you're well aware, we recently presented the schematic design um, of the proposed community center at the East uh, Recreation Center block. And um, during that presentation, we described the addition of a second gym. So we have one current gym. We have, we're proposing a second gym at that site. Uh, this is an important piece to that project because we have heard a lot from the community about concern about the gym space, about how we are going to um, conduct our programs with youth, older adults. And often I think what's maybe missed in this discussion is much of our adult programming, meaning adult volleyball, not programs from the Friendship Center, often take a lot of time at the East Rec for uh, gym space. And so this is a component with the addition of a second gym that can significantly increase the department's ability to program multiple spaces at one time. So as I mentioned in the a council agenda item, this also increase our, increases the scope of the project from a design uh, perspective as well. 
And so ISG, the architect that we have hired is proposing this uh, change order for these additional design services. Any comments? Are we ready to vote? I think we are. By roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Iden. Aye. Borzakowski. Aye. Schollmeyer. Aye. Motion carries. Moving on to item 5.4, the health insurance program funding. Councilman Thurley moves to uh, uh, approve the resolution. George will second that. Okay, motion by Alan, seconded by George. Discussion? I guess hearing none, we'll vote. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Iden. Aye. Warshakowski. Aye. Schollmeyer. Aye. Carries. Item 7.1 is council concerns. Uh, we'll start with Paul tonight. Oh boy. Okay. I have three things on my list. Um, and I know it's been a long night, but uh, I think they're important. Um, so I know, I hope Chad is still listening. Um, Manager Sarvi, uh, fellow council members, uh, Sugarloaf is just getting hammered. Um, last week uh, in my drive-bys, there were at least at least 20 vehicles. The weather was great, of course, uh, out there uh, every day. And, and um, Thursday or Friday, maybe it was Saturday, I think there were more than 60 vehicles uh, parked all the way from the current, the, the turnout from Super 8 all the way up to residents. I mean, it was crowded. And so um, pay attention to the condition of the trails because with that, that much traffic, um, you know, our, our trails can really uh, take a hit. And I think we need to really seriously think about how are we going to accommodate uh, these vehicles all the time. We, we have to do something. Um, secondly, uh, congratulations to the city and, and Parks and Rec um, for uh, getting support from the state legislature for uh, the riverfront trail uh, and from the bonding bill. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm definitely looking forward to uh, that, uh, that trail moving forward and, and getting some more infrastructure for all those additional people we're going to have living down by the river. I will say, though, I am disappointed in the legislature and, and uh, you know, I don't know if I can say it, if, if I, I, we didn't get enough support from our state legislators and in the state bonding bill for the TCMC uh, second train project, which would have been $19 million in construction right here in the city of Winona that would have added more than two miles of side rail that would have probably benefited freight and our shippers here in town more than anything else, maybe even relieved congestion at Mankato Avenue. And so that's a really big disappointment that we uh, failed to get support at the state for, for, that, um, uh, for that bonding request and for those infrastructure improvements here and on rail that would have helped passenger and especially freight customers here in our community. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, George. Okay, uh, just to kind of, I guess, right on the back of what Paul just said is I'd like to thank our local legislators, uh, Gene Pulowski, Jeremy Miller, for their uh, support in this in this up this bonding bill. Uh, it's certainly what with the ports, what they're going to receive, it will certainly help our Port West Dock Wall, which you should be able to now finance, and also for their money for their Riverfront Trail. And I especially would like to single out Mike Chikanowski and Lucy McMartin for their help and their continued uh, pursuit of this riverfront trail. I know Mike put a lot of time and energy into it and uh, 
he's uh, really a driver for it and uh, his efforts came through. So that's all I have. Thank you. All right, thank you, George. Pam? Yes, um, I would just like to encourage the Historic Preservation Commission to take up the issue of demolition by neglect. I would like to see them, see the HPC get all the support it needs to do so. Uh, uh, old stone and brick structures downtown are not the only buildings that need to be protected. There are a lot of stately old homes that are, that are needing protection as well. Thank you. All right, Eileen. Nothing for me, thank you. All right, Al. I uh, do not have any comments tonight. All right, thank you. Moving on to the consent agenda, there are three items. Approval of the minutes from October 5th and the final adoption of an ordinance to declare Wabasha Street through from Franklin to Hamilton and an ordinance to establish no parking school zone area on Kansas Street. Councilman Thurley moves to approve the consent agenda. Eileen seconds. Okay, motion by Al, seconded by Eileen. Any discussion? Hearing none, we'll vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Iden. Aye. Borshikowski. Aye. Schollmeyer. Aye. Motion carried. Mayor, if there are no objections, I move we adjourn. Pam would second that. All right, we have a motion by George and a second by Pam. I'm assuming there's no objections, so we'll vote by roll call. Mayor Peterson. Aye. Councilman Thurley. Aye. Moeller. Aye. Iden. Aye. Borshikowski. Aye. Schollmeyer. Aye. Thank you, everybody. We're adjourned. <laughs>